Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Unslaved. Happy to be back with you today. We are continuing this look into masonry, getting into the origins, and I'm uh, very excited to dive into this one. Excited to see what Michael has for us today. This one's called Princes of Light and the Origins of Masonry. Um, so, And we got a new article to go along with it. So, Michael, let's take it away. Yeah, thanks. Um, did another article. Uh, I've done several on it in article form, but we've really only done one serious podcast on this remarkable subject, and that was Jews and Templars. We must make a note to put that below. Uh, this will be like a good follow-on uh, because there's so much disinformation about the origins of masonry that even though people who maybe have listened to Jews and Templars or have browsed the articles on female Illuminati, all the, all the articles we'll be talking about are on female Illuminati, Com. So, but, and then they might think, wow, there's just so many threads. It's quite convoluted. You're all over the place. Yeah, well, so is the disinformation all over the place. And it's been there for generations. We're fighting uh, a great deal of disinformation. A lot of it has been put there de totally deliberately by Gentile authors, by uh, uh, bono, you know, card carrying anti Semitic authors who want to leave a lot of false trails. And then there's well meaning authors. Some of them are my, you know, top mentors. I mean, you know, who also have, uh, in a way, foolishly followed that thread because it does have a lot of credence in some aspects. Think of the Bolshevik Revolution, right? Uh, and they follow that, and and you know, kudos to them for taking us that far. But it's a deeper dive that we want to do. You know, I mean, Ralph Ellis has already shown that you have to do that deeper dive if you ever want to get into, say, the history of Judaism. You've got you're back into Egypt as Josephus Flavius and other ancient historians hinted. So it's not just going to be starting, you know, uh, where a lot of these authors start. I mean, it's not that there's no uh, Jewish conspiracy, but it's that one has to get the details right if you're properly going to investigate this. Otherwise, things go wrong very quickly, and innocent people are being accused of something, you know, huge. And also then the ones who've laid the false trail they're obviously concealed. This is all about concealment. This is all about somebody in the long grass sacrificing other people, you know, which of course anyone listening to us must know that that is indeed the pattern of history and Jews have fallen foul of it, just like many other people have fallen foul. foul. And another one we must link up to is the program on Khazars, which goes into great detail. You know, it's a premium length, but we did it as a podcast. The members have got to check that out. We'll link it below. There's another red herring dead end, but with elements of truth. It is true that Gentile races, Turkic races, Tartar races, Russian, you know, Swedish, whoever can convert to Judaism. That's been done for centuries where people convert. But that doesn't mean there's any bona fide racial ties, but that could be used by some very clever people to lead you astray from the actual truth. Then you've got your British Israelites. We haven't done anything like justice to them. I've got programs on the British Israelite deception. I go into it in the volume one of the Irish origins, but we haven't done. There's so much more to get into with that. They have fallen for a bunch of red herrings. And again, Ralph Ellis's work would be you know, essential there because it clears up the whole story of how Jews got to Britain, how the story of Jesus getting to Britain, did those feet in ancient times, you know, walk on England's pastures green, as Blake put it. Uh -huh. Uh, well, he was in jail, but his feet did, did actually walk on England's green and pleasant land. Yes, uh, that's quite right. Uh, incarcerated as the lunatic was. So, you know, you've got that angle. And then the Mary Magdalene story. Yes, it's tangled. Yes, there's many players and actors in this whole story. We'll be talking about the guy on him in a minute. But don't get overwhelmed by it. Because you've got to realize that we are making our way through bomb damage. And a lot of it has been set off on purpose, right? A lot of fires have been started in order to get us to run here and run there. And then, because this was called subtitled The Origins of Masonry, we do know that there's a lot of Jewish symbolism in masonry. You're just going to have people arguing, and they're quite right on one level. Hey, hey, and even you, Michael, you say the G. That's, you know, the guy on them, they're sure they were Jewish. So that's the ends it. Yeah, I'll go, yeah, but it's the five-pointed star that you keep seeing on the great checkerboards. In fact, even the checkerboard, is that Jewish? 
Surely I would have thought that was Knights Templar, since that's the color of their flag, black and white. The picture I chose, you know, for the banner of this program is George Washington wearing a apron. It is one of the most ubiquitous symbols in masonry. But isn't that Knights Templar? Because they were builders and they were the castrati. And the apron, we pointed out in female Illuminati Pro, it's actually female, but leaving that aside, it's to cover the genitalia, but also to, it was made of wool. And it is a parody, a, a copy, a, simula, a simulacra of the woolen undergarments worn by Knights Templar after they had castrated themselves. They were obliged to wear and never remove. You know, there's an elaborate ritual of how they wore these undergarments made of wool. And so the woolen apron covering the genitalia was the sign of we are the castrati. And even holding the trowel, see, in masonry, things have multiple meanings. The trowel works as a euphemism for a blade, you know, that uh, did the deed, as well as being a bricklayer's tool. You know, they, they're laughing at you. They got 101, you know, and, and right, sometimes right on the apron is the symbol right in the middle of the compass and protractor, which actually is a euphemism for the castrating tool. From a distance, the castrating tool looks like a compass and protractor, and it's right over the genitalia of the of the apron. So the apron is more more Templarish symbolism than it is Masonic. Although it also goes back to the Phoenicians, but many of the Phoenician builders were castrati. They were goddess worshippers. They used to have the boats. The Phoenicians were the great mariners, and on the front of their boats, the the boat was she, and they'd have the horse's head, or they'd have the goddess symbol. So most of them were Masonic, just like the cult of Mithras. It's not just Masons and Templars who were castrati. This was an incredibly common motif. And so when you decode the symbolism of Masonry, you have all of this castra it's castration. It's in Article 1. But that doesn't mean that the, there's no Jewish symbolism. There is. But the, digger, the, the deeper dive, uh, you know, Knights Kadosh and all of this, right? They sound like Jewish terms, right? Uh, uh, Knight of St. of Solomon's temple, that sounds Jewish. People would just swear. But the thing is, if you could show that it's not Jewish, it's Setian or it's Atonist, that there's already, because what you'd be really showing there is that those that you imagine are Jews aren't Jews at all, you made your point. Well, that's what we've done. That's what Ralph Ellis has done. That no word in, in in the language is more inappropriately used than Jew, and it does represent uh, sacerdotal things. It was used in the Eleusinian mysteries to represent a, a degree, a, a, a grade. In the Eleusinian mysteries, Jew represented like the I don't know the third degree or something, the third stage. Then you've got the Jewess in masonry. Three brothers, sometimes portrayed as blackguards or thugs, who uh, assaulted Hiram Abiff and killed him. Reason unknown. Or some other traditions say, no, it was uh, second area, the second, the, the pharaoh, who the bloody deed was done to. He's walking in the corridors and three ruffians, as they call it in masonry, attacked him and killed him. And we'll come back to this because when we get to this... Uh, incredible image of the masonic uh, coffin which which you also see on the banner that i've chosen you'll see a, a coffin there in front of george washington and you'll see it on all sorts of i first saw it in the 12th of july parades in ireland and it stuck with me you know along with the ladder and all that. but the five-pointed star isn't jewish that is an occult symbol that far predates judaism so what's it doing there in masonry so we've got the person who just gets off at the station and says, oh, it's all, all that Jewish symbolism. They're already got a problem. And if you stay there and continue researching just on that level alone, well, I mean, those pillars that are central to Masonic uh, uh, tracing boards, right? The two columns of Yakan and Boaz, those are Egyptian. So there's a lot of Phoenician symbolism. There's even Celtic symbolism, if you just but know where to look for it. 
So the thing is labyrinthine. And therefore the answer, as simple as you try to make it. Now, okay, so there's we've handled the, the symbolism in masonry. It's, it is definitely, I'm not going to accept for many, many years now, I have not been willing to accept that you just say it's Jewish and that's, we're done. But then you have the people who scream about the Bolshevik revolution being top heavy with Jews. That's right. Apparently that's the case. We had the, the Khazar fiasco. We've got the Ottoman Empire. One of our first uh, interviews was with Diana Springola, maybe episode six or something like that. Oh, and let's make sure to link that up. Churchill uh, and the Ottoman Empire, and so much more needs to be done on that. But in that program, we brought up the fact that the leaders, up to five of the leaders, the Porte, as they're called, the port uh, of the young Turks who seized and had control of the whole of the Turkish Empire, which was in the allied, allied to First World War Germany. That's how powerful that was, but it's a, it was a, at one time a great empire of its own. They're all crypto Jews that ran it. Go back and listen to that podcast. Then you've got uh, uh, anecdotes like the Scottish right in America has been noticed by many, many people, even as high up as, say, Carol Quigley and people of that level. Scottish right is almost entirely a Jewish organization, they tell us. Then you've got uh, even more plausibly the fact that a top Rothschild, Nathaniel, I think his name was, it was Nathaniel Rothschild, was funder and a key member of the Cecil Rhodes' round table. One of the top heavy honchos of the Rothschild dynasty is right there in the top levels of that, uh, you know, as it later became known as Milner's Kindergarten, which is just the steering committee of the CFR and the Skull and Bones and almost every org worth its salt in that cropped up in later America, including the Council of Foreign Relations, you know, like I said, the, the Trilateral Commission, they're all run by Cecil Rhodes' roundtable group, who went on to be, you know, the, R, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chatham House, you know, uh, and super Jews of that nature are also on the Privy Council. And I can think of other examples, uh, say the Martinists' secret order, full of Jews, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, <laughs> It's going to be very difficult to for for anyone to counter the anti-Semitic claim that Jews, you know, are not running the world conspiracy. And if you tried to do as I do to say that's not strictly true, there's more to it than that. Your work is cut out for you. So just again, an introduction. If you if people find this information a little bit hard to handle or overwhelming, you've got to realize that. You, we are fighting a paradigm, a narrative that is centuries old and is itself labyrinthine. So you have to do the homework. There's no way you know, to make it simple. And so the article, although not long, the new one is short. I just wanted to tease out again and consolidate some of the facts, maybe add a couple of new things. Uh, because what we're trying to do slowly over time is actually you know is get to the heart of the matter which very few scholars actually get to which is the history of judaism itself you know because as ralph ellis has shown the house of edessa for, for, for example which was pagan which was parthian and they would have more to do with persian mysticism say in their heyday and of course he rightly points out that they're also Atonists. And if they're Atonists, then they must be Setian. Ah, but wait a minute. When they leave Parthia and move into the Middle East and settle in Edessa and Syria and Palestine, they marry in with Jews. Well, wait a minute. I thought the, the, the way the Bible portrays, say, let's take the Essenes, for example, or the, or the Nazarenes. These are two groups. But they, and Ibionites, all these three groups and many others had vows of poverty. If you go by what's in the book, you know, the official history books, some of these Jewish uh, sects were waiting for the Messiah and some sort of life of Brian situation. They're out there 
sitting under their mushrooms, waiting for the day, hating on the, the guys at the Temple of Jerusalem, the super wealthy Jews, you know, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and men of that, the merchant class, hating those guys, ready to murder them. And actually, they were being murdered by the zealots. We use the word zealotry today. It comes from a Jewish sect. They, they didn't make any claims to poverty. They were like, you know, bandits, banditos, who were stabbing and murdering their way through Judea. Just like your BLM, sorry, your you know, yeah, your Antifa guys, just pure anarchists, high on drugs, right? But then, how can this prestigious house of Edessa, one of the most powerful of the Eastern Illuminati, as I call them, arrive in in, in these lands and just marry in with rank and file? They couldn't be rank and file. That's the whole point. And if Ralph Ellis comes along and says this is where the fourth sect comes from then I'm afraid that we have to reprise our understanding of the, you know, the, the Nazarenes at least. Maybe, maybe okay, you know, the evidence does show that the Essenes were, had a vow of poverty. But uh, if such a royal dynasty, uh, people who are con contenders for the throne of Rome, and then think of your Herods, these other extraordinary, you know, families of the East, who had lands all over the world, who were put in charge by the by the Caesars. These are eminent people. If they married in with, if they were Jew, you know, they were from a, a converted, Herod was from a family of converted Edomians who were, again, non-Jews who converted to Judaism. That's why Jews didn't really pay much attention to the Herod, didn't even like him, him and his family, because they said, well, you, you guys are just converts. When we found you, you know, in Judah, when we found you in the Holy Land, you were a bunch of pagans or whatever, you know, worshiping God knows what. So we're looking at the history of Judaism. We find out some very, very interesting things. And the top most interesting thing is the Hick the Hyksos connection, the direct connection to Egypt, not as slaves, but as royalty. Now, Ralph Ellis is by no means the first person to have appointed this site, but he's the one that really connected the dots in a way that's absolutely extraordinary. So there's there's even mainstream historians then, just based on what I just said, have to question this vow of poverty. But then what are you going to do with the uh, Nassians? What are you going to do with the Jessians or the Therapeutai or the Galileans or the Mandeans? Right? I mean, you... Do you know how many sects of Judaism they were? Sure, the Nazarenes and the Galileans hated each other. And it was when St. Paul came along, he sort of aligned himself more with the Galilean tradition and snubbed the Nazarenes, but he did worse. He stole their lore and he stole their Jesus to make what's known as simple Judaism, which actually becomes the Catholicism, the Christianity, the Pauline papal version that everybody's enslaved with you know, later. But this originated with a group of people called the Nazarenes, run by the brother of, of, of Jesus called James. And they looked at Paul or Saul, and of course now with Ralph Ellis's contribution, Josephus, Josephus, Flavius, hello, what a revelation there is there. The world should shake, but the man has been hinterlanded because you know they don't want to know these things. Well, this James cursed out Paul, as the wicked priest in Essenic and Jewish literature. And the Jews kept quiet about that. You know, it's only been teased out by mavericks. But the Jews always knew who the wicked priest was and who the teacher of righteousness was. But this had to be scrubbed by mainstream historians because they don't want you to know about the Nazarenes and their connections like to the Knights Templar and you know other groups, very powerful groups, or maybe to even much earlier groups coming out of Egypt. But see, anybody who's been following the lore of what's known as the Copper Scroll, you can go to Article 2 on the female Illuminati site for that. Professor Feather, who's the leading expert in the world on the Copper Scroll, has found direct connections to the owners of the Copper Scroll, that's the Essenes, and Egypt. Not just that, but Akhenaten's era of Egypt. So do the Nazarenes have the similar connection? Or, 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 or some of the other ones I just mentioned? And then this leads us to those richer Jews, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Who the hell are they when they're home? 
could they also if you can find three four you know jewish uh, sects that have a direct connection to akhenaten's egypt and this is found by people who know nothing about what we're talking about about akhenaten and his the aftermath and the hike sauce and all. no archaeology they just followed their noses and find that the copper scroll was made in atonism at the time of, of the rise of atonism when billions of tons of gold were trans you know shipped between these groups completely revising you know, because since 1948 with the discovery of the dead sea scrolls and other chronicles the gnostic gospels there has been revolutions in what we know about the history of judaism and that's just scratching the surface i was hoping to get the programs you know that even go deeper into it and that will help enormously to clear up a, a little bit you know like we're doing right now it's vast okay but if you find that three or four of these groups linked back to akhenaten's egypt we've got a question what about the real high brows because they talk about the coming messiah most of them but they all have differences about who that is and what he looks like and <clears throat> how oh, you'll tell them from the false ones the, and how you you know the false ones will be amongst us claiming to lead but then you find out that the highest group of all the highest sect hated by most of the others was the sadducees and where's that word come from who are they and why do the history books say well after the fall of the second temple and the destruction of judea by the romans puff of smoke they were gone from history and not a single squawk out of any of them. They cease to exist as a group. You can divide the sheep from the goats from the reader who believes that. And I'm afraid everyone believes it. Everyone I've ever read. Nobody gets into what I get into. And this will include a handful of Pharisees, you know, because they had economic connections and family connections. Sadducee comes from the term Zadok, sons of Zadok. Well, who, what's Zadok? Zadok is the diminution, the, the shrunken uh, phrase for Melchizedek. Well, who's Melchizedek? Well, go look it up. Go to a Bible dictionary or a Bible encyclopedia. Go to Wikipedia, wherever you want, and put, type in Melchizedek. You won't find much. He's a, he's a, a, a high priest of Egypt mysterious figure that abraham runs into as he's entering into egypt which tells us next to nothing but it tells us a lot once you bring in say a ralph ellis thesis and goes oh but abraham and sarah they were pharaohs so now melchizedek you know once you do all the homework we're not going to waste time on it here it's the same story as you get with the moses character and the aaron character it's it's akhenaten it's just a nice priestly cover well there's your connection to the sadducees then the sons of zadok so just like i mentioned that there was many different uh, sects of you know within judaism I didn't mention the uh, you know all of them there's so many um so there were priests classes we've all heard of the levites or the rabbis but what about the zadokites what about the shilohites what about the aaronites and there's others I mentioned on the astrotheology zone site. And all of them didn't agree. You had, you, had, you had 10 high priests of each of the tribes of Israel, and they're not the Levites. The Levites are separate again. <coughs> each tribe had its own priests. For each tribe. That's a lot of priests. How many people could tell you how many priesthoods there are within within Judaism? And this not even mention the Kabbalists, which was a sort of a supra order that any of the other priesthoods could enter into uh, uh, if, if and when you wanted or if, if and when you were accepted. But when you decode that, as we have done, you find out that the only Jews or anyone else who's going to get into that level are those who understand the androgyny story of, of Yahweh and, and uh, realize that Judaism is primarily also the worship of the goddess. Now you can be initiated as a Kabbalist because the Kabbalah is Kabel, Sabel. That's the Greek version. But the, the Jews had the female version of Asherah or Anat or Astarte. 
or Ashtaroth. And these are, are, are personifications of the Godhead, which is why there's all these fe feminine uh, etymology, female letters within the name of Jehovah and Yahweh and even Elohim. A, plural, a lot of them are plural, and certainly they're feminine. And, and this has blown the minds of scholars the, uh, you know, who refused to, to then go further and tell you why that is. Well, if it all goes back to tree worship and the goddess, go to Egyptian iconography and you'll find reams of images showing the goddess in the tree, as the tree, the burning bush story. It's more about a god. It's, it's actually borrowed from goddess symbolism, not god symbolism. Who ever told you that? And it's also a sexual euphemism, the burning bush. Get into all of this in the Trees of Life book. You, you wouldn't believe what's going on. So there were certain priests who favored, kept it alive. And later on, this fifth sect of Galileans that Paul identified with that made the papal system, actually some of them went back to this goddess worship. We're not going to talk about that now. That was the, one of the themes of the female Illuminati program. Sickened of the patriarchal, patristic, reading they were either seduced into or of their own free will these are members of the college of cardinals went back to more of a pro nazarene pro uh, whatever you want to call it they started goddess worshiping again even in the fifth sect so the story of the fifth sect this is our pauline christianity is also a fascinating story of another sect, another group that run the world for years. And then Protestantism is the breakaway from that. Uh, and so it goes. But without these occult origins of what we're talking about, and the occult origins lead farther back than Christianity's birth, they lead to Judaism. Judaism at the fall of the first temple, uh, you know, the time of Babylon. And, and then they had the, <clears throat> oh, you know, Syria invaded them, right? They've been invaded, taken hostage and all this. All right, and so, except for the Persians, who the king of the Persians smiled on them and finally let them go so they could come back to the Holy Land. The Jews remain there. The Israelites scatter to the four winds. That's why the Israelites are the lost tribes. They're all allegedly gone. But that let the muthmongers make up endless stories. That's why I say it is literally encyclopedic. After their liberation by the Persians, they go back home, you guys. First of all, they've all been cosmopolitanized. All the Jews are a completely different group than was taken into captivity. And many of the, if you, to understand the Bible correctly, right, the judges and the prophets and the priests, the fights between them is because some of the prophets believed that the Jews had become far too decadent because they'd lived amongst Babylonians and Persians and picked up a lot of their evil ways, these sort of hedonistic. So the Bible is replete with, Remonstrations from, you know, Amos and Jeremiah and you know, Isaiah, come back to your ways. You've broken the covenant, you bunch of hedonistic buggers, right? But the point I'm making is that look, history of Judaism includes the dispersion of the ten tribes is a vast story. That you know, because of members and all, you know, we're inching forward to be telling that story, and it's really known under the rubric of the British Israelite. Would be one you know nomenclature you could use philosophy and it's just unbelievable for the amount of lies that's involved in that but the interest what interested me is because if you follow their thread it is an account of why jewish symbolism and jews themselves arrived in the british isles it's one account nine always didn't sit with me correct right but you've got the master at what they're talking about it's ralph ellis's work that really explains but uh, you know that doesn't discount the other. It just it just you you got to know the British Israelite story because it turns up in people like Tony Bushby, although he himself also has an alternative reading of you know. So it is connected to Mary as well, though, just like Ralph says. So there's been several different iterations of how the Holy Family came to the West, and it, it has to also you know it goes back to the split between the ten tribes. And the two tribes of Benjamin and Judah that went back to the Holy Land. 
And so the word Jew, as we know it, can be seen as relating to the land of Judah. But it also relates to Judah, uh, you know, uh, the patriarch. It's a name as well. It's not just a top. It's not just a geography, a region. It's it's it goes back to you know the son of Jacob. And so there's there's all there's a play, there's already a play there on a, a name of a great patriarch that became the eponymous. Uh, patriarch that they say and then that gave you know but is this is this any truth to any of this because Israel Fallis is showing no it's from the other direction they go into Egypt and come out again and then settle Israel and Judah so and then my question was well yeah that's all fine and dandy but uh, those words are nothing to do with what they've been presented as those words are to be found you know in in Celtic lore in Celtic etymology when you know how to apply the key of decipherment as tree lore, as it's Aryan, it's Druidic, uh, then you find the absolute reason why the word Jew is used, for instance, in the Eleusinian myths. And Jew as was picked up in Masonic lore and all of this. It, it's an incredibly tangled tale. But back to these uh, Sadducees, that nothing, see, this anecdote about the Sadducees. And what happened to them after the fall of the Second Temple, without that little anecdote, I don't believe that the origins of Masonry could ever be uncovered, not wholly. And you'd be stuck with them, the people, well, it's Egyptian, look at them, there's aprons there, you know, and you got Harim, Abif, uh, the original Temple of Solomon might have been in Egypt, you know, you'll have all of that, it's valuable, very, very valuable, you know, and uh, he was a Phoenician and uh, they made the wood and they came and built Temple of Solomon. So it all dates from that. And then other books take it back rightly to the Knights Templar connection. As I said, the flag of Britain is the Templar flag. A bit odd that then. But the Templars were meant to be Catholic. So, oi, Orange Lodge guys, ever seen the Ulster flag? Ever seen the flag of Britain? St. George's flag, right? Yeah, but it's Knights Templar flag and they were allegedly Catholic. So how, how does the Orange Lodge account for that when they're fiercely Protestant? Because they know what you don't know and that Protestant and Catholic divides are meaningless. This is something to do with deeper symbolism that transcends those silly divisions. But the Sadducee connection is to the sons of Zadok, the high priest, Melchizedek, read Akhenaten. That's why they're elite, because they're super atonists. So already we see that the word Jew has to be taken with a pinch of salt. These are atonists of a very, very high level connected to the pharaohs. Well, that makes perfect sense then, because the very few authors that have ever talked about the subject we're talking about always make mention briefly, too briefly, unless you know what you're looking for, that the Sadducees were deep in with the Roman elite. What? Yeah, the top Pharisees and the top Sadducees were in with the highest there is in the Roman Empire. Not just the Caesars, the emperors and the governors, but their wives. They were well in, they were family guests. They owned property in those lands. They owned property all over the Roman Empire. Well, if you're hobnobbing with the best that Rome can produce, why do those authors not understand that then you must have done with the predecessors, the Egyptians, the Persians, the Babylonians? I mean, why? It's a fucking no-brainer. And is it also the reason why they were so hated and assassinated by other groups within Judaism, precisely because of their wealth, precisely because of these extraordinary economic connections they have? And then finally, back to the point, you don't just disappear in a puff of smoke if you are that powerful. But you might have the power to rewrite your own story. And if you're in with the historians of the time who all are living in Rome, and the brothers Livy, right, and Strabo, and who the hell you've got from Greece, from especially from Rome, they're writing your story because 
their dollar, your dollar is in their pocket. And the orders are coming down from on high. This is in, in key. So, but the little slivers that were left about the fate of the Sadducees, once you know what you're following there, the origin, the real origins, and I hold by this, of course, don't ask anybody to believe it, but I believe that that, it lead, <clears throat> that leads us to the uh, a thread relating to the origins of masonry that nobody else has followed. Right? And in Masonic lore, which is how I found all of this out, there is a very important cardinal symbol. So like in my Trees of Life book and Irish Origins, I don't just deal with random symbolism. Some of those books are dedicated to the special, you know, cache of symbols that are very special to Masons and special to the occult societies. And just try to keep following those to where they lead, you know, like to the goddess tradition, to Celtic Ireland. You just keep following. And one of those is the symbol of the coffin. And there are three stories about the Masonic coffin. I don't know if you're on the article. You could actually show people. Scroll down, you'll see the symbol that I'm talking about. If you go to Article 8 on the Female Illuminati site, David, then you'll see. While I'm talking, you can maybe pull it up. You'll see what I'm talking about. Sure, I'll grab it here. Um, it's a very important symbol. And it is a, another allegory because it works on three levels, right? That could be the corpse of Hiram Abiff. And the lid of the coffin is open slightly because that means, you know, there's a possible resurrection. And we all know about the Skull and Bones Society, right? Where they say that they're born again through the coffin. And uh, Masons use this all the time. So when Skull and Bones do it, they're clearly Masonic or they're basing themselves on a Masonic lodge. If not, they are a branch of it, right? So the coffin is a jar in masonry and you can see the mummified body. So immediately, if it's a mummified body, yeah, then it could be, <clears throat> is there any way to enlarge that now? See, the mummified body inside could allude right away to Osiris who again was interred inside a tree as Isis and Anubis ran around trying to restore his body. But what part of the body was the part that they could not find was, of course, the penis, the phallus. There's your castration motif again. And in return, Horus castrated Set. What's going on here, right? But... The symbol there of the coffin can also be second Henry, right? The, the, the pharaoh who was cudgeled to death by the three ruffians. Or Hiram Abiff. It's all allegory. Different lodges, different stages of, of uh, the degree ceremonies. They'll teach you a different you know, nuance to the story. But actually, this image, when you finally really study it through and through, it is known in masonry that it refers to a rabbi called Yohanan ben Zakkai, who is basically one of the most illustrious rabbis in Judah during the time of the Roman invasion. And as I've said in another podcast, that invasion was precipitated by the internal violence of the Jews. And the Romans were very, very loath to interrupt anything to do with the economy of the land. They were very, very, very tolerant of anyone that they conquered, so to speak. And they were on such good terms with the upper classes of Judah. But it was, sorry, it was the Judites themselves that called for police action because so many of them were being murdered by these fanatics and so much of their property was being burned and so much of their goods were being stolen. It was like, you know, oh, it was like a 2016, you know, America. So the Romans finally exacerbated by this, Titus, and his son, uh, uh, sorry, I think it was Vespasian. I don't remember which one was the father. So Titus and Vespasian said, enough is enough. We do need to send a message to other parts of the empire that you're not going to act like this on us. We can't afford to lose control. And so they marched in and they crushed Judah. And the false historians just tell you it was a unilateral act of, of great brutality. All lies. 
It was exacerbated Romans who were very, very loath to do this. And it was internal politics that forced the hand. However, the top brass were forewarned long time before and knew this was coming and prepared to get out. They repaired to their other lands where they owned property and villas all along the Mediterranean, anywhere the Roman Empire was. And they also went, for our story's sake, the most important group of them went east because they had already had mercantile connections with groups of the Eastern Illuminati, including, say, the House of Edessa. But there's connections, you know, like with the Herods and you know, all sorts of creatures, right? And then there's this Atonist Setian connection. So a group of them move east. Now, the coffin symbol is exactly that. The, they claim that the live body of the rabbi, Ben Sakai, was smuggled out of the city. This is how they tell it with an insider smile because they know it's all allegory. That at night, like some Clint Eastwood movie, he's escorted out of the burning city in a coffin and his life is saved. Behind the allegory, we get the Sadducees flee the city by night. <clears throat> Excuse me. They, uh, they're the dead. Because, one, they're going to rise again. That's where the lid is open. But two, as the dead, they no longer exist historically. Big sigh of relief to them then. Our forefathers weren't even literate. And those who are scribbling things things down were the mythmongers. That's why things are so tangled today. Well, what, this thing about history, Christians are Jews, I just can't follow it. That's right. It's called mythmongering. If your forefathers had written things down accurately, you wouldn't have this confusion. Get it? So they... Tell the story in masonry and do a merry little dance. The story, because remember, what we're going to say is that these masons are descended. They are this group. Now, the group that goes east settle in big cities of, you know, the Persian Empire. What we know right now, you know, sort of like Iran and Iraq, Baghdad, especially and Pombita and Sura and places like that. And they do very well. They're already very wealthy. They've got family out there. They've got very powerful economic connections. And so they do very, very well. And they build their own temples. And uh, as I say in the article, you know, and we've talked about it before, the Jeffrey Epstein sort of uh, shrine that he built there on that island is, is a very, very good likeness of what I'm talking about with Muslim design because they're technically in Muslim countries and they're well in with those Muslims. And anyone who knows about the history of Islam knows that the entire Islamic uh, empire, all everywhere you find it, was run by Jews administratively. And these guys on them also did that. So they were highly respected. But they were respected for other reasons as well, because everybody knew their lineage. You know, sorcerers and apothecaries and all the rest of it. Astronomers, <clears throat> special people that, you know, had all of his occult power. And then, long after Rome has fallen, and the status quo is very, very different, the time comes, this will be about sort of a, moving into, say, the 10th and 11th centuries. This group of, of what's known as the Gaonum, or the Gaonate, start, or that's how they at least present themselves officially as Jews, uh, but I, I always look at them as crypto or whatever, they start moving back. Their descendants start moving back westward. Making their way back to where they came from. And along the way, it's the movement of this group that's very, very important. Because as they move westward, at some point, they change their name to Frey Masan, Sons of the Sun, Princes of Light, Freemason. 
And then without going into a long story of it, they have several meetings of importance. Out in the East, they'd already married in with the House of Edessa and other occult societies, I've already mentioned that. Uh, and in our program, Eastern Illuminati, we should link that up. You'll hear about the Arontids and the Comagenes and these other families out there for people who don't know anything about it, the Herods, right? Uh, so they're already in illustrious familial connections, right? Then the big event, of course, is that as they move west, they encounter the Knights Templar leaders as they're on their first crusade. And then they, they link up. And it's now that, because it's also been recognized that the Knights Templar were in league with the Nazarenes, fourth sect. See, there's on surface they're Catholic, but the Catholic Church is, is going to suppress these guys very, very soon because they find out what's going on. That in the East, the Templars who went East as Catholics stop being Catholic. In other words, stop being fifth sect when they met the descendants of the Nazarenes and possibly the Essenes or whoever else they bumped into. But the guess of most writers is it's a Nazarene sect, the sect of, 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 of James. And they're converted to the real Christianity. And so this then immediately links them to the Gaionum and to the House of Edessa, because the House of Edessa is also, right, during the time of the Roman Empire, you know, you have to read Ralph Ellis on this, but in brief, they, when they arrived in Syria and Palestine, they married in with the Nazarene sect. And as I said, it wasn't a bunch of impoverished. Why would one of the most illustrious families start marrying in with just rank and file Jews? Didn't happen. It was very high level Jews. So here we see a pattern emerging. And so the nine strange hermits, monks or pilgrims or whatever, that all the bloodline writers of the Merovingian story know, that accompanied Hugh de Champagne and Hugh de Pines over to France, to Burgundy, never been identified. Their leader was a strange character. Who the hell are they? Nobody can answer. Were they Essenes? Because later on, the Templars under Godfrey de Boulogne form a group called the Cistercian Monks, a monastic order. Why? Bernard de Clairvaux, right? Are these Guyana in the West? Because they're still around. Cistercian order still exists. The point I've made is that these Sadducees, the sons of Zadok, are already Atonist anyway. They are probably outranked the fucking Templars, for all we know. If you have to get into that whole thing about ranking, it's not a very good idea because the, the Merovingians are already deeply involved with Judaism through a group called the Benjaminites. Again, Article 2. And the Benjaminites are the twin tribe of Judah who were expelled because of their own crimes in Judah were expelled into the West. They, at a previous age, move into the West uh, with their leader, Dan, and bump into the Franks, uh, who are the proto-Merovingians. Franks doesn't mean France, it means German tribe, but because there were so many of them in France, France, France got, got its name from this tribe of the Franks, and they're very interesting. They were pagans originally, and goddess worshippers, right? So the Danites, in the form of these Benjaminites, marrying with the Merovin with the Proto Merovingians, and there you have that, and that's why you know uh, their king William de Galon, the great Proto Templar, the great Merovingian, was called a hook nose, because and there's so many other Jewish anecdotes, and that's why wherever the later Templars went, the Jews were tasseled to purse. Wherever there was a big bastion of Templars, right? That's Merovingians. So right near whether it was Spain in France and other places or in Spain, wherever Templars went, Portugal, there was always a very large a Jewish community nearby. And later on, when we talk about the clerics, this connection is absolutely vital to understand to where we're going with this. 
So the Sadducees then uh, are the Freemasons, which is one account of why there is this Jewish, if you have to keep on using that word, right? Symbolism in it, including the capital G, because that's Gaiornum. It's just as simple as that. You know, and I, in the article, I explain other, other meanings of the symbol, like the lowercase g would be a serpent symbol. Well, if you can, there's another thread. That's why I say it's very, very complicated because then this brings in the steering committee of the Knights Templar called the Priory of Sion. Uh, that's the Serpent Sisterhood number, right? These Queen Helenas back then and these, uh, you know, uh, Ara uh, Queen Arania and Thea Muse Arania. Her daughter, who's the real Mary Magdalene, you see, they're, they're all part of that group. What a story that is. And it's also been told in code and allegory. You know, the three grail maidens and the whole thing. So these monks, I believe, the proto Cistercians, were wined and dined by the Knights Templar, honored and respected, and given homes in the West. And so that is why Templarism and masonry are just intertwined and anyone who ever tries to contest that and guess what there are there's people all over the internet books have been written to translate there's no connection between the two even though with your own eyes you can see that there is and you just say the apron the wool apron is a simulacra for the woolen undergarments of the castrati the knights templar you bet it's templar and on and on it goes So, uh, the whole allegorical story of the Gaionum is told, you see, in this uh, tale of the coffin. That's just one Masonic symbol that shows you that resurrection of the Sadducees was going to happen. So, the sons of Zadok, the sons of Melchizedek, the order of Melchizedek is alive and well. And it's working alongside the Knights Templar. That's key to the understanding of the origins of masonry right and in masonic lore and tradition they enact all of this what the hell you'll find anecdotes in bloody movies right like indiana jones type stuff right of all of this that we're talking about but most people don't even notice it right so this guy on them, then as they moved into the West, they also stopped. One of the third things that was important, right? We said about the meeting of Edessa, the connection with the Nazarenes and the Templar connection. But wherever the Templars go, you're also dealing with Italian merchants and Silesian pirates and all. There's a lot of uh, handshaking. In fact, the, the Masonic handshake is also Mithraic. The wearing of the gloves and the grips and all of this and the salutes. So this is a vast story of cabals getting together. One more ugly than the rest. There's no good and bad and ugly, it's just ugly. So, but a very large contingent of them stopped in what we know today to be modern day Turkey, in Thessalonia and Salonika. And this is a very great interest of mine. We've talked about it way back in Unslaved. Uh, and there's so much more to say about it, but and then the Thule Society premium, I bring some of this up. This group of Guyana, when they get to Turkey, they become these sort of you know crypto Jews that are running the Turkish Empire for the lazy fat ass sultans who just sat around in their harems eating dates all day long. But one of the footprints there is that they uh, invited hundreds of thousands of sort of persecuted Jews from southern Spain because those Jews had served the Moors, right? another connection to Islam. Islam in Spain, Spain was conquered by the Moors, who were an Islamic group, but they sat back on their fat asses, and it was the Jews who ran their Moorish empire. So the natural Spanish people hated the Jews for working for the oppressor. So when the Moors were overthrown by Christian kings, the Jews now were like up against the wall. We're going to get you bastards because you served our oppressors well guess what all of a sudden the guyonum descendants in turkey said we'll make a home for you here and so you know i don't know what the number is like almost a million persecuted jews spanish jews fled spain and moved up to live in salonica area and in turkey 
That's nice of you guys. Thanks a lot. But of course, this philanthropic, this act of philanthropy had a hidden agenda. The guy on him wanted to disguise themselves. And you do it by getting a bunch of ordinary religious Jews. You know, like the peanuts, the packing. So you're less conspicuous. In fact, you're invisible. And you can get up to all of your occult practices, you know. And so now you start getting lodges like Grand Orient and the Martinists, even these quasi-Rosicrucian orders, you know, on the Protestant side. The, the thing can start from there. The Turkish connection, and I show in the Thule Society some intriguing anecdotes there, because the Thule Society is formed by Rudolf von Sombotendorf, who came out of Turkey. And Turkey and Germany have always had the deepest connections. There's anyone living in Germany who knows. Right? So, uh, you know, they've been allies and all that, right? But Alexander Parvis, who almost single-handedly created communism, came from there. Basil Zaharov, the biggest gun runner ever known in history. Again, people must go to the Thule Society, you know. Link, uh, check that out. This this creature, he turns up in the James Bond movies as Blofeld, that character. It's actually based on a real-life character. <clears throat> he was Turkish, and on and on it goes. And then, as I say, the five leaders, the young Turks, who are all pro-communist, to call them liberals is doesn't cut it. Go back to our Diana Springola interview. Three of them ran, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, three of them fled into Bolshevik Russia for safety. So there's no doubt about it that these were crypto Jews, and they their descendants still run businesses in the West to this day. Oh, and although they were allied with the First World War Germany, we know how that worked out. That was a that plan didn't really come off. Uh, Germany itself was crushed, and the Ottoman Empire fell. And there's so much to be said about that. We just want to focus in on the secret society intrigue that's also Turkish. And that is why the Shriners were the Turkish cap. You know, for one. And that red is blood. The Turkish red cap with a little tassel is all based on what we're talking about. And it's the Turks saying, Islam saying, you know, we will soak the word in blood. We're in blood up to our heads of the Christians, <clears throat> just letting you know, right? And the great big scimitar uh, and all of that. W what the hell is this weird uh, Turkish symbolism, Muslim symbolism doing in masonry? Well, as I said, the whole thing, you've got to trace it all back. You've got to know what you're talking about. And why on the symbol of the Shriners do you have the face of Akhenaten of all people? You've got to trace it back like we're doing right now. And you have to have the patience to do it step by step. They know you don't have it, the patients. That's why they're laughing. They've they nothing to worry about there. The, you know, the symbolic keys of decipherment are not in people's hands. And all of these groups we've been talking about look like, uh, you know, they've been uh, all different. And where are the connections between them all? And you need certain mavericks like Ralph Ellis and all, you know, to, to, to give you key pieces. But Sigmund Freud plays a part here. You know, there's others. Uh, I make it all available in my work where it all comes from so that people can make up their own minds. So the Turkish connection is absolutely important. Um, the spoils of the Turkish Empire, you know, okay, say somebody like Benjamin Disraeli or, you know, organize it to get, get hold of it. But it, it, that, that wealth never goes away because the order of Melchizedek, what they say goes, right? If they were behind the rise of the Turkish Empire and they were into the drugs, and they were into the gun running and the opium dealing. And there's even indications that they were massively involved in white slave slavery. This is even whistleblown on certain shows. You know, the Turkish connection, because these sultans wanted white flesh. And their agents, no problem, whatever you want. But the city of Lyon in France, I mean, this, this really goes, you know, places like Luxembourg, uh, Brussels, You'd be amazed at where these people ended up, you know, having headquarters. London, of course. Well, Templar, London is Templar, and Tem it's, it's just so obvious. 
when you get to that part of it. Uh, and then the fifth, the only thing that remains really to say is that the fourth sect <clears throat> that plays a key role here, you see, why are they really different from the fifth sect is that they were the Nazarene sect were left wing, what we would call socialists. So this is where it crosses over then into a political statement and stance. And masonry is the same. If masonry was formed by these people, and don't this is not hard to understand because we see today that socialism is uh, funded and uh, promulgated by the richest in the land, your George Soros's and above. Why couldn't it be the same during the Roman Empire? Why could top level rich as blazes Pharisees and Sadducees not have been communal and socialistic or what passed for that in those days well we know now that that is not a, a big stretch we've understood what champagne socialism is and it's essential to understand this so this group oh and we didn't really say that it's also connected to the black nobility which is a term you just use for the royal families of europe be they protestant or catholic uh, you know, uh, coming out of Venice, Britain, uh, sorry, Venice, uh, Italy. Uh, there's other connections you see to Holland, the Merovingian school over to Holland. <clears throat> and then, of course, that group moves over to Britain. And, you know, you have that whole story. There's a royal tie-in here. And the Jews were tasseled to purse with them as well. Bankrolling people like William III of Orange, who came over and fought James II, the Catholic king. But if you think it was just a Catholic Protestant fight, you're sorely miss like everyone in northern ireland thinks that yeah but james stewart the catholic his daughter is the wife of william the third mary mary stewart is married to the protestant overlord that wipes out her father and takes over the running of the uk and opens the bank of england and therefore enslaves everyone to the debt of that war. The, the Amsterdam bankers gave him so much. Uh, there's actually, I don't know if it's in Diana Springola's book or somebody else, actually state the, the price. I think Nicholas Hagar has the whole of the details in there. And so they just turned around and went, oh, you can pay us back. Oh, well, not you, but the indentured slaves of Britain that you now rule over, they can pay us back in perpetuity. And I think some scholars actually think that to this day, the debt with the interest hasn't been paid off, or at least was paid off only recently. This is in 1690. The Brits had barely paid off the debt while they're waving their flags up at Buckingham Bloody Palace. Chains of iron, chains of gold. The British bank, right? of england and the debt slavery began oh we should have mentioned that in the opening about the different jewish bankers you know everyone knows about them right but they've got the wrong end of the stick as well they don't understand the atonist connection and the connections we're looking at right now <clears throat> but far more important than that is this socialistic bent so when the knights templar were suppressed though and this is what we want to finish on and get to Okay, the leaders go here, they go there, they go to Lyon, they go to uh, Switzerland primarily, and that's where the that's where the Templar money is. Those great banks in places like Belgium, London, primarily Switzerland, not to mention offshore. These were people who knew the Mediterranean Ocean, the right? Mediterranean Sea. There are mariners, so a lot of it is offshore. But the, the, the symbol of the Swiss flag is, is a Templar symbol, for goodness sake. Yeah, and it's the reverse colors because of what we're going to talk about now. And this is really the key that brings it all together. Because in the 1314, you know, 1307, when Jacques de Molay is burned at the stake and the Templars are suppressed all over the world because the Pope sent out the edict that all the kings and lords of the world should arrest the Templars and have them executed and seize all their lands and everything. Several countries didn't bother doing anything like that, particularly Scotland. 
but there was other locations as well because those kings had been put in power by the Templars and stayed fucking loyal to them, right? And also they had a blade to their throats. And that blade came in, you know, the Templar Empire was able to continue existing because of the group that I talk about, and I'm only the exclusive one who does, of a group that I call the clerics. You can call them clerks, lieutenants, deputies, seneschals, marshals, whatever you want to call. And these were this army of worker ants who served the few Templars that actually we're talking about. And those Templars were fucking illiterate. They couldn't even write their own names and they couldn't read Latin or Greek. So all the correspondence between the Templars and their you know, confederates throughout the whole of Europe and further abroad, all the calculations, the banking, the looking after the stables, the horses, and all of the different assets were run by this anonymous group of deputies. And when the Templars themselves were suppressed, absolutely nothing changed. The Knights Hospitallers, there's a story about how they tried to rip the Templars off at this time, but quickly realized their mistake. And they were eventually you know, put in their place and they became aligned with the clerics. And then they changed their name to the Order of Malta, the Knights of Malta tried to steal money from the Templars or the Templars had given them some money and they tried to keep it. But the clerks soon took care of that with a bunch of assassinations or whatever and moved right on in. And so the Knights of Malta became clerks. But not just them. What we know is the Illuminati is in a super Jew, financed them, Moses Mendelssohn, who was not only a super Jew and loaded the, so rich that he could fund the Illuminati, he was a Jacobin. The Jacobin or the left wing Coterie, you see, that started the, you know, the, the French Revolution. A Jacobin. Super wealthy Jews. Well, not super wealthy Jews are the Rothschilds, the Oppenheimers, the Warburgs, the Bowers, all of those guys. Why would they be supporting left-wing causes? When the average religious Jew is usually very conservative, highly a believer in individualism, and a diet-in-the-flesh capitalist. That's who they are. See, so again, things are conflated that we think we put at the door of the Jew. We may be sort of liberal, but so are many Gentiles liberal. No, no, who's this ultra-leftist Jew? Are, are they to be, you know, we've had guests like Charles Moskowitz on who completely show you that this is not the case. He wrote a book called uh, Left-Wing Anti-Semitism. Because what you don't know and are never meant to know are the, the steering committee Jews the conspiratorial Jews who actually despise Jews. See, you know, the Gentile hasn't been told about that. These anti-Semitic authors also disingenuously never mention it because that would blow their whole gaff. But back to the point, the clerics then take over the empire, but that's not the end of their story. They become the press, they become chemists, they become lawyers. Oh, and publishers. They become other things too, like cartographers and genealogists and what have you. But those were the main professions. And then they start secretly opening other secret societies because the Templars are giving them orders to do exactly that. We were a secret society. We controlled the world. We did banking. We're suppressed. But guess what? You open a bunch of satellite groups run by our people, and some of the, some of the, some of the, you know, even the Templar symbolism shows up on those quasi-Masonic lodges. So Scottish Rite, Strict Observance, Grand Orient, the Martinists, Lodge Theodore. I mean, it goes, I mentioned all of this in my work, right? All bankrolled from places like Switzerland. But that's not the end of the story. Because the fifth sect were persecuting them and still uh, looking for them, there was danger abroad. And some of the kings of Europe were willing to do as the papal edict said and arrest the Templars. And they were the kings that owed the Templars money. So of course you want them suppressed because then you don't have to pay it all back. And by the way, you can even go and seize some lands and this, this, this did happen, right? So the clerics decided to do something extraordinary. And this then is so key to what we're going to, you know, my whole thesis. 
And as far as I know, it's never been ever pointed out by any other author. And that is that they are converted in mass to Judaism. So they'd been working, like I said, in Portugal, which is a huge Templar bastion, by the way, uh, in Spain and France. And I've just included Turkey. And of course, we have Britain. Anywhere that they operated, the Jew was working alongside them, tasseled the purse. And we, I've tried to sketch in the reasons why, the early connections between these groups during the First Crusade and what have you, right? They're fourth sect. And so they, they're married in with Jewish families, some of them very powerful. So lower Jews say, yeah, yeah, I got no problem working for you guys. We know you're not really Catholic. You're fourth sect. That's, uh, we, you know, stay, stay quiet about that, right? And in the lodges, that's why you open a lot of lodges, because then this is where the secrets are disclosed. And in the Jewish lodges, the Jews are disclosed to this. Those guys are not what you think. So, and this sounds outlandish that so many Knights Templar lieutenants, they're basically quasi Templars, would convert to Judaism? Yes, but in the 1600s, as all Jewish scholars know, Zabbatai Zevi, or Zevi, the great Sabbatean, creator of the Sabbateans, when his ass was caught, he converted from Judaism to Islam. The Sultan was going to have him executed, so his only way out was to convert to Islam. A hundred years later, J Jacob Frank of the Frankists, just continue the Sabbatean tradition, he was caught and was going to be executed, but he converted to Catholicism. There's your precedents, except they're not precedents that come after, but the point is made that this kind of thing happened. You were given leniency. But what's not told to you so much is that the army of followers of Zabatai Zavi and the army of followers all over the world, the back crazy motherfuckers who followed these two jerks thinking they're the Messiah come back, and they, they, they're twist, like the same kind of creatures you get today. You know, I am the 666. No, but I'm Jesus too. No, I'm your Messiah, but I'm the devil incarnate. All this twisted stuff. People believed it and followed these guys. Doesn't take much to drive people into hysteria, right? But these are not just rank and file Jews that followed Zavi and followed Frank. These are some of the wealthiest ones out there. And they converted too. The Sabbateans in mass converted to Islam. Crypto Jews are in Islam. Scroll forward. Got Muslim Brotherhood. Got Islamo communists running wild, causing havoc, pulling down the Shah of Iran and causing havoc. Any connection to. No, it's all the Ayatollah, it's all the Sunnis, it's all the... You don't know that Islam has been infiltrated. It's in the books. You don't know that Catholicism, i.e. Christianity, has been infiltrated by the Frankists. But I'm more interested in a previous conversion in the 15th century of a group that worked closely administratively alongside Jews and had a lot of you know things simpatico and then in the great need to hide from the forces of the fifth sect the clerics converted in mass to Judaism so now do you see why when you're going around accusing Jews you're actually really accusing crypto Templars this is very important and their left wing right now do you know why it appears to be the Jews were top heavy in communism or Bolshevism and likewise in other places in the world, anarchists, and you're out there burning Jews for this? Liberal Jews, conservative Jews, wealthy Jews. History is just studded with nothing but pogroms and anti-Semitic writers who don't know the fuck what they're talking about and always get it wrong or partially get it right. You've got some that are better than others. Douglas Reed, Yuri Lina, right? 
But none of them have got it right, folks. Eustace Mullins, you know, but I've, I've worked, I've looked at all of their work thoroughly, inside out, upside down, and know where the flaws are too. And this was a perfect cover. And then when you're a crypto Jew, right? Well, when you're a crypto Templar, I mean, hiding under the veil of Judaism, you now have the ability to infiltrate legitimate Jewish businesses because the person with whom you're entering into partnership or whose daughter you've married has no fucking idea about occult Judaism. They don't know anything about this conversion any more than a Christian knows about it. So to give an example, I'm a, I'm a Jew, Jewish businessman who's done very well, say, in the silk trade or in gunpowder or in the, one of the big things was diamonds and, you know, precious stones. I meet this other Jew who says, hey, I want to come into business with you. And they do. They, they sign up, right? And they're doing business, and that one guy, he says, you know, hey, this is a great business you've got. Wouldn't you like to open some more? Make it into a franchise. He goes, yeah, but where's the money? He goes, don't worry. I've got some rich relatives. I'll get some money. You know, they love me. They live across town. They're rich. So Jude number two, the crypto Templar, of course he's got a pipeline to the fucking – biggest cache of wealth that anybody could ever lay fucking eyes on. But he pretends that, oh, it's some rich family members. They might invest in us. And he brings back a million fucking Deutschmarks. And suddenly, the, the Jew number one who invented the idea, invented the machine, or invented the system, his business explodes. <clears throat> but after the documents have been signed, it's the money man who really owns everything. And the, the Jew number one is maybe only kept on, if he's not completely swindled of his money, he's kept on only as the figurehead. Get it? Because there's a camouflage happening here. And Jewish businesses throve, throve. Well, of course they will, because the Jews work closely together. But factoring what I'm talking about, you can enter into a Jewish relationship with somebody who's banking, money lending, whatever, and you can immediately see success because you have a cash of wealth that they, they don't have. And so you take over their businesses. You get them to sign it away and say, this is for your protection. If anything was to happen, I get the blame, which really means, no, mate, you're right. I own your business. And he's family. He's one of us. And so the Jews have been taken more than anybody else by this ruse. And then only to find themselves, you know, innocently, but they are the brunt of the anti-Semites, thick, thick heads, the neo-Nazi crowd, right? Later on as well. But we don't, we've lost everything. We've lost everything. And yet, you know, we, we end up in the brunt. But these crypto Templars are the ones who really own everything. So they're converting to Judaism, you see, turned out in the end to be very, very lucrative. And that's why you find them, you know, their descendants in the highest positions of politics and why they've even uh, orchestrated things like the Bolshevik Revolution. So I just hope that this, uh, you know, helps to explain <coughs> the, the, the rise of socialism. And then through the, see, uh, not only did they open uh, secret societies, these crypto Templars, but they opened the guilds. Hmm. They opened delivery companies. Hmm. They opened many chivalric and equestrian orders. These Monteforte Fiortes and uh, Montefiores and uh, all sorts of you know uh, Jewish families coming out of Amsterdam and Lyon. But you've got to understand that these are only like the Rothschilds. They're not Jews. They're not Jews in the sense of any religious connection or any racial connection, you know, at all. And through the guilds, they're able to meet. 
unable to recruit new people and get their sons and daughters in to where they need them to be and then also through the lodges <clears throat> you know and they can they can close lodges and fold up these guilds and you know but these are often uh, fraternities by which they can uh, ply their trade uh you know and they've done that for centuries and anytime there's a problem like there was a problem with the knights hospitalers they're equipped to deal with it because the real templars their masters haven't gone away and they immediately give them orders going you go get our money and if that king or that duke owes you money we'll get it and if we don't get it from him directly we'll abduct and murder their children or you know their wives or something we'll we'll get the money or we'll burn their properties or whatever you're dealing with something pretty sinister here and they're the ones who are still in power and you know i make the case on the female illuminati site for those who are interested so but it's important that you realize the connections to the eastern groups you know the Eastern illuminati which includes the turkish sort of empire and even what we've just talked about now you know is is just part of it you know but i hope uh, we've uh, covered some of the, the the really most important parts here you know but uh, when, when ordinary well-meaning hard-working jews opened these extraordinarily successful businesses little did they know you know what was going to happen any more than when you joined cecil rhodes's round table and you thought that they were pro-british conservatives how wrong you were what the agenda really was and then one last thing is that when these crypto templars converted to say islam like i've mentioned or christianity or judaism you've got to realize it was little it was simplicity itself because look after all they weren't literate and the average jew might have been smarter than the average muslim and christian back then but look at the end of the day they weren't that intelligent these guys i'm talking about really were the intelligent ones right so infiltrating these groups was child's play you know as intelligent as some jews are and everything yeah but that didn't stop nothing so these guys were able to become very wealthy very quick and then when you're lending money to people you know it's a royal road to success isn't it you know because these especially these princes the black nobility are land rich but money poor cash poor and so you know every which way you turn you've got a way to bankroll your own uh, empire the templar empire it's really really a fascinating story you know it answers so many questions when you break that down like that like and it's questions that i found naturally researching into it and even following up on sources you've mentioned over the years and just trying to get into it and you know, you read books like The Curse of Cain and Eustace Mullins and, and right. other books. Great information, great books. But like you said, interpreting it through often a very literal interpretation of the Bible or things like that, that, you know, kind of you, you understand it. You know, I think it's well-meaning, but still missing that piece. Right. And then um, not to discount the great amount of work that many people have done to try to crack this, but when, the way I started to think about it after some of the shows we've done, because I've seen this in our community too, it's loaded in my comment threads as well. Like it's all about this and that. And, and you have a lot of people that are in this movement that truly believe they they've got it cracked with, with who really runs it. And their target is the Jews. And you go, well, it's just so amateur to me because we're talking about a, a group of people here that have their own private cult their own private religions that the common man of any era didn't really have any part in because it was reserved for the elite houses only. And they infiltrated and actually created a lot of the modern forms of what we call our various religions. I started to see the same thing happening in the medical system, right? Of infiltration by some very insidious groups that turned something that was originally meant for good into something that was used for control, right? So I guess that's how I explain it now to people is I just say, just think of it like this, like we see the whole Vatican and the whole Vatican thing. And we don't, we know not to lay blame on all Catholics, but to look at it as, Hey, that thing got infiltrated top to bottom by this very dark group. We've, you've referenced the quotes for many years, Michael, from Duke of Brunswick and many of these other European aristocrats talking about how 
they saw this infiltration taking place within the Masonic orders and they called it out even to the point where they were ready to disband the whole thing and quarantine it because it was so bad. And then you have, uh, when it comes to Islam, you mentioned what that went down with the Muslim brotherhood, the Shah of Iran. Um, not every Muslim out there is, you know, to be blamed for what's going on at the highest levels of the Islamic occult world. And then the same with the Jews. It's the same thing. And you go, how, how does that not make more sense that we have a group wearing the costumes of publicly accepted groups, but don't really buy into any of that shit. They just use it as a vehicle to build their hidden empire. And then, like you said so brilliantly, what a great way to put red herrings in the mix where people are chasing their tails and we never find out who the real big boss hogs are, right? Well, I'm glad you reminded me of that because isn't it, how, what would happen if the anti-Semitic writer, not the ones you mentioned, but generally the ones that troll the, 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 the net and other scandal mongers, these sort of neo-Nazi types, they yeah. are funded by the very hand we're talking about. That the, the so-called anti-Semitic writer is one of their agents to lead you in the wrong direction. See, when you're a wolf in sheep's clothing, that doesn't mean you like sheep. So mm. if, I, if I infiltrate an order for various reasons, it doesn't mean that I really have any feelings for that group. And if I have to put those guys on the chopping block, I will. Just in that analogy I gave you about ripping off a genuine businessman and taking his wealth for my purposes, which I believe has happened rampantly. Right? In the same way, on a larger scale, I don't need to care about any of those people or their traditions or their silly Messiah beliefs or anything. I just go along with that. That's what the Rothschilds are. That's why they're keepers of the Vatican Treasury. That's why they're Knights of Malta. Work that one out. Or like I said, these Protestants with the Catholic flag, allegedly, they couldn't answer that. So the contradiction, see, this is what you have to follow. These writers, of anti-Semitic writers, for the most part, could be in the pay of these clerics. Because they do want to keep, you know, uh, the story that I've told hidden. And that's why nobody comes after my work. Nobody wants to, there's not a podcaster out there, right, who sincerely has picked this up. Yet, yet it explains a lot, you know, and we've, we've not talked about the Setians or the Order of Sion and all that. There's so many other things to get into, you know, uh, and this uh, blindness. See, because remember, anyone listening to this or anything lengthy like this, and we're in it right now, actually, is appropriate because now everyone is saying, how can we fight the cabal? Even somebody like Tucker Carlson is being removed from his position. He may go on to do great work. He may just evaporate. But he is certainly not the only one who's fallen foul of the system, for God's sake. Mm. The books that they've scrubbed, the great journalists that they've scrubbed, right, from time immemorial, the sort of George Orwell whistleblowing types, who now you can't find their works and all of this, you know. Because who, who do you think runs the publishers? Just study the symbolism on the publishing companies. And why would they pick X, Y, and Z, right? And then forget and, and not publish the other group, you know, like these Commons Beaumonts and all don't get published, but it's okay for a Graham Hancock or somebody, you know, it's like, I got fucking questions there. Ralph Ellis has been pretty much hinterlanded. His work should be every single earth shattering brilliance. And then the bigger question, of course, which is pertinent to our times, how do we fight this group? Why don't people rise up? The women are screaming, where are the men? <laughs> well, after your fucking treatment of them, there's a simple answer. What do you mean where they are? They're fucking back way off because you're no longer willing to play a supportive role. You've been going crazy and hysterical since the 1980s. But now it's being reiterated in who's pushing back against Big Brother, you know, in any country. Well, some groups are, but then they get shadow banned off of the net some you know fairly semi-genuine groups some better than others you know but they can't get the publicity out and i always say more deeply what's the fucking point of trying to push back when you don't know their actual histories of what you're dealing with and you've been expertly the mob has been expertly go down that road burn those jews out go 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 yeah that's right while the boys on the balcony are sipping their fucking brandy and go, yes, well done there, dear boy. And raking it in. Real Jews 
with the real name, with the real Igayonim, the real Sadducees. Do you know how many places they've watched burn and they fiddled while it happened? Sure, they were there at the fall of Judea. They know how to work the rabble. They've learned from the zealots and the Sikari. They said, yeah, they're our enemy, but we've learned from them. Next time we want to mobilize a revolution, we'll go back in our minds to Judah when they overthrew us. Let's never forget our enemies and how they work. In fact, let's create our enemies and how they work. Because remember, what one thing we left out in all of this is the psychological insight that they have in, in terms of all their enemies. Right. It's a insight that we don't have. So although I don't talk a lot about, you know, I don't I don't offer anything but psychological, you know, whatever, you know, solutions to people listening to me. I think if you applied them, it would be hugely fucking brilliant, you know, in the fight against today's, you know, on the street, it would be valuable. But since I don't have any faith, because America, for one, is a highly anti-psychological country, and that's its greatest weakness. And then if you take our, you know, Feminization of America podcast and Kevin McDonald's thesis, you realize uh, that, see, see, the real handicap for anyone, and I'm talking here about really zealous, well-meaning people who want to get out there and, and fight the great fight. I believe that, I believe America's loaded with people like that. But they can't find the map. You know, they're, they're like a, there's a stone in the shoe that stops them climbing the mountain. And we don't have people out there who are still alluding to this stone, you know, or how it got in the shoe. If you did, I think it would enormously help the situation. For instance, see, the big brother knows that, oh, well, they, to cut a long story short, they awaken the guilt complex. I've talked about this for, for years, right? We did a whole set of shows on Red Ice about this. And so there's guilt and there's shame. Now, these are destabilizing psychological syndromes. And everybody has existential guilt, you know, but that, that's considered to do with existential philosophy about living an inauthentic life. Yes, that's been mobilized and used by the controllers, but there's another kind of guilt separate to that that's much more powerful in destabilizing masculine energy or, you know, people who would normally say you didn't have this type of guilt, what I'm going to explain right now, you'd be in the fucking streets pulling down towns, wherever. They, no drag queens, no fucking queers, not a sign. You wouldn't even need protests or trucker meetings or anything. No, because it would be torn down in their schools immediately. But why is it not? Who studied that? Just like I said before, that Oppression is entirely an attitudinal thing. It's along these lines, right? Now, take Christianity as a very prime example, since America is mostly Christian, was in its inception. The trouble is that the leaders know what you don't know, and that is that metaphysically, religiously, theologically, you believe a total and utter fucking lie. It's called Christianity. It's called belief in God or whatever, right, in that form. In, in your deepest conscience, you know that the shit that you believe when you sign on for that religion, and this includes Judaism and Islam or any other related thing, but since Christianity is really what's happening in the West, we have to focus on that, right? If I believe in any doctrine, and I've, in my work, philosophical work, always showed you what the alternative is. If you could sweep that shit away, there's legitimate hermetic principles that are the true Western tradition, right? But no, people insist on being Protestants and Catholics and all that. But do you realize that when you sign on for something that is so absolutely bankrupt of truth, so utterly false, you know it. So the question of whether there's critics or opponents or rivals or Sam Harris or, you know, I avoid those books by Dawkins, or, it doesn't matter whether those people exist or not. I'm talking about psychologically. You know in your conscience what you believe about Jesus, the afterlife, Mary, and God, and all the rest of it. Uh, all these Catholic countries, these Irish, these Mexicans, these Spanish. It's bullshit. You know, for instance, why is it that the most Catholic countries, fucking unbelievably Catholic countries like Spain, Portugal, and Northern Ireland, today 
are the biggest supporters of say the gender dysphoria thing right or the most political correct the most tolerant of that how can an ex-catholic remember what we've talked about prior prior to this about compensation mm. same in america because of the puritan pilgrim fathers right after a few hundred years we have the flip side of that which is the hedonism and the libertinism same in the catholic countries today you see them that they're super tolerant of all these weirdos and freaks right they won't even prosecute that you know they're trying to normalize it all because they themselves were under the yoke of christianity that's again moving to the social level consequences of believing in false religion no i'm now moving to the absolute microcosm of the self and this is the royal key that nobody i ever hear talk about and it's why we are immobilized when it comes we're turned to stone when it comes to fighting the tyrants and the tyrants know this that you have for centuries believed a religious lie and what that does is it awakens a very strong primal guilt against yourself and that guilt immobilizes you so that when the outside group make you guilty in their way like you're guilty you're racist look how you are to these people look how narrow-minded you are when it comes to these transsexuals and the gays and the blacks and the blah, blah. they awaken secondary guilt and that resonates with the original guilt of your religious knots that you're tied up in you know the belief is all in the front right but deep down inside anyone who philosophically believes a lie is in a very very impure and toxic state it goes for new agers it goes for a lot of people but let's just keep it because there's a direct line to the Christian forefathers in American context and why there's so there's men walking around but nobody's doing anything about the most obscene things that are taking place the unlimited immigration you know the, the call for rights uh, all, all of the obscenities of the social justice groups right and the postmodernists, the critical theorists why we allow all this to be taught from you know our schools and all of that? Why? Why is this a mobilization? Even when you've got great, great call to arms, it's because of Christianity. I don't want this to turn into a fucking rant, but that's what you know. Sometimes you need to st state it out loud because you believe existentially, or <clears throat> your fathers did. People around you believe in this fucking nonsense. It awakens, like, and you can't help it. It's a natural, organic response to falsity. It is the awakening of a deep sort of inner guilt. Therefore, you're guilty. Right. But if I come from the outside and say, you horrible, conservative, narrow-minded ratbag, you don't like those homosexuals getting married and having children, or you don't like you know, the single mothers, accuse 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 they're making me feel guilty from the outside the media right the newspapers the, the leaders the thought leaders the influencers they want to saturate the external world with guilt even our own daughters and sons are being telling, dad you just an old right my god you're so narrow mind guilt 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 yeah because the the welter of guilt that is generated by all these fucking snowflakes and whatever is designed to uh, stimulate the inner guilt and then you're paralyzed you're immobilized this is the key that's why you can call to arms you can run in the streets with uh, you know bullhorns and say it's, it's happening follow me let's go uh, things like this used to work but they don't work anymore because of the length of time and this is the the thread of uh, feminization running in america courtesy of your christianity this is the damage it's done just part of it by the way just part of it but it's left a crack because when you ideologically in the deepest you know you go to church you believe in it you believe in it you believe you know it's really emotional but it's a fucking lie and you you can't even argue it i mean obviously you know it's like when they astrotheology theology work or whatever and you go and you start talking to these christians they're fucking lost look at this esoteric thoughts guy right did brilliant work to prove this all the detractors that he had all the conversations he has Right? They don't, the average Christian cannot converse with you about shit. He doesn't know the history of Judaism. He doesn't know about the Gnostic elements that proliferate in even St. Paul. He doesn't know about this fucking Atonist Constantine. <coughs> Again, with the solarization. Hey, look up, I saw a vision in the sky. And on the moment they're solarizing you, they've got their private worship. They're total reverse, you know, backstage. 
and they've hidden the real original away like yeah i just did a little prezzo on uh this great book i finally got a physical copy of it album boy coon lost light oh. interpretation like the lost life. I, I couldn't even get through the preface it's a bible yeah it, like we're going through the preface of this book was the presentation mike i couldn't even get into the meat of the book and already there was enough in the preface for crying out loud it's okay. like a, i'm like and that, and that he was trying to like say it's the original was lost and replaced yeah. and that is like a hors d'oeuvre an appetizer to his masterworks that is just yeah. the hors d'oeuvre the wow. lost light to his greater works he was a disciple of gerald massey he had a fucking nailed i mean we're talking way way you know but again yeah alvin boyd coon gerald massey oh yeah they pertinent to what i'm just talking about as many others were as well to show you that what religion really is the priesthood of the illies that created these satanic religions knew that you're on your knees figuratively but this is what it means to be on your knees is you're guilt ridden if you believed in hermetic truths which are always connected and aligned to nature you can't go wrong because it's like Ayn Rand said, go back to your basic premises. When nature is your basic premise, you can't go wrong. Build your ideologies by all means, but build it out of the natural religion, organically. With nature always as your lodestone, your keystone to go to, your go-to place, right? We've lost that and we butchered all the different you know people that were into that. And what that did was it awakened a very natural, see this guilt is not a bad thing. This is part of your conscience, which is directly connected to the moral universe. Right? I have the podcast people should watch in the moral universe where this is all explained. So the guilt that I'm talking about is not a bad thing. It is a corrective, but we just let it fester. And that's what's happened historically. It's festered and festered and festered and festered in every Christian group. And that is why when they dose you constantly with guilt, I mean, you're not going to save your transgender child. Didn't that child tell you that they don't they don't feel like a girl? They want to be a boy and you're standing in the way and the doctor, you know, say to the parents or some other fucking nut tells you you're standing in the way of your child's happiness. They're going mad, they're pulling their hair out and you dare to stand in the way of their happiness. See, that's guilt. So the mothers immediately fold, and sadly we see the men folding as well. Instead of taking a fucking strict saying, you're a fucking nut. You know, I'm the male in the family, and I'll tell you what gender you are. You're born a fucking boy, and that's it, mate. And until the day that you leave the house, you can do what you want. But fuck this shit, or I'll throw your computer in the fucking lake. Showing some balls and, and saying, right, you're out of that school. Is that what they're teaching or they don't want you to be uh, gender and that's good they're not even talking about mr and mrs and he and she and mommy and daddy are not even mentioned as names you're out of that school as of now you know and this is being promoted by the churches now you see these mm -hmm. churches now that are out there they're in my in victoria they're they're yeah. out there flying these flags the priests themselves are transgendered right yes and then you got the this pope this Jesuit Pope out there just endorsing all the globalist stuff, all the climate right. stuff, all the gender shit. And you're like, yeah. so even when they're, you're like, oh, I'm defending Christianity. Well, what are you defending now? It's totally no. not even close to what you thought it was, let alone taking it to somebody like a Alva Boy and Kuhn telling you where it originally came from. There's a very good book by the great writer, Peter Hitchens. He's a Christian. He's the brother of uh, Christopher Hitchens. Right. They were always yeah. divided because Christopher was an atheist, of course, as we know, and Peter is a Christian. And he wrote a great book. I recommend everybody, I recommend all his books. Get the fucking lot if you can. And they're becoming much harder to find. But the book, what I'm thinking right now is uh, called uh, The Abolition of Britain. Maybe we could link it up. Uh, he did The Broken Compass, which is another classic about Britain falling into, the, into hell, right? Anyway, and just search on YouTube for speeches by the man. In Abolition of Britain, he talks about these transgender clergymen and he runs through their agenda. So it's a really good book to read. It's a good book anyway, but it's excellent on this subject of how the churches were taken over by all these weirdos, right? But that's right. But guilt, <clears throat> guilt, guilt, because they have understood the Freudian concept of the guilt complex. And it works on a deeper level than what I've just said, but this is the one that really is a... Uh, 
how would you say, applicable to now. The other one is the existential guilt, you know, which is a totally philosophical matter and doesn't pertain to anything we're talking about right now. The other guilt complex, the one that the, the controllers of, you know, focused on is the religious personality type. So even though you may say, well, I'm secular, I don't go to church, I, I stop being a Christian, it doesn't matter. You're in the culture of a Christian culture. And that means that on some level, morally or ethically, or somehow that same guilt is being stimulated within, you know, on an unconscious level. But in the very religious person, because it's those guys who who would uh, who claim to be, you know, onward Christian soldiers to fight for truth and God, but they're immobilized, they're not doing it, and they never will. I guarantee you there's not going to be any change or rising up against anyone because these fucking bastards and at the at the helm know this. And so what I'm talking about, obviously, is that you would have to completely renounce all forms of religion before you could fight this evil tyranny. And, of course, we know that that's impossible. So that's why I don't sit with bated breath waiting for anything. You'll have flickers. You'll have greatness. You'll have really good men trying to do good work. I'm not saying that. But it'll be buying the bumper sticker, you know, and all of this more than it will be actually going and taking control of our institutions and, and when people see see what if, if people are listening to me right now you can take the deepest breath you've ever taken in your fucking life because now you know and you don't have to be plagued morning noon and night with a question of why 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 aren't people rising up you've just heard the reason and so now you can divest yourself you can breathe deeply and say got it got it michael You've relieved me of so much tension and worry. And I'm polishing my AK-47, but you know, and nothing's happening. I'm sitting here, right? No, just take a big fucking deep breath. The doors have been kicked open. The windows have been kicked open. It's religion. You believe a lie. You can't argue it. You're a Christian. You've been a Christian all your life where you believed in some fakery along those lines. And you don't know the first thing about your religion. You don't know its connection to tree worship, the Celtic world, you know, the Phoenicia. You, you, don't, you don't know anything about it. You, there's nothing you know about what's in the Bible, right? But you know on a deep level of the conscience, you do believe this lie. And it's, you believe in it for all these sort of inauthentic reasons. Fear of death, you know, whatever it may be. But the basic, just to keep it short, you believe in a lie. And you feel guilty uh, on a level of conscience because of it. Now, that guilt is a bad enough individual crisis in your life. It is. It can lead to loss of faith and, you know, all sorts of different things. But what you don't understand is that that's been weaponized by your controller who has you by the balls now, right? The strings to which you are, you know, the glove puppet is that they are working on the guilt. So they find ways in society to make you guilty of this and that and the other. And it is just a torrent of it, an avalanche of guilt. White man, you got to be less white. You don't know that? Coca-Cola tried it with her, you know, be less white. I mean, what the fuck? Well, who runs Coca-Cola? Who runs the drug trade? Because that's what that is. It's a drug. It's just a sugar drug, right? You know, Look at the back of the Atlantis book. You'll soon fucking find out what's been going on with that. These are the same old groups I'm talking about who knew how to purvey and make money for alcohol. And, you know, that's all been gone over even in the first book. These are the great merchants. But on a psychological level, oppression, see, there's two keys. Oh, the, the person who believes that they're oppressed is oppressed instantly. And they will seek out then you know, instances of his alienation and his oppression. Secondly, the guilt complex, which affects religious types who know that their religion that they believe in doesn't have a fucking ounce of logic or credibility. They'd rather fight with these Dawkins over tables, you know, because you're defending the impossible. But that's where they'd rather go because it's a, a way, it creates a lot of noise, a lot of static, by which you don't really have to look within and face your guilt. Well, isn't the same true with the Dawkins type on their cult? Like, isn't it this one group versus another that have the same? It's just a uh, different template of a very similar dynamic happening. Yeah, uh, you could say that. I mean, I'm not an atheist, so I don't believe that they're right either. 
you know what I mean? So that, 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 that yeah, it's Tweedledum versus Tweedledee. But why people are interacting like that all the time, why these debates are endless, is because for both sides it creates static. The materialist is a dogmatist, scientist, scientism. They have to have static so they don't see the, the lie of their materialism as the McGill Christs and others hack away at it, right? It, it, it's fucking goo, right? Oh, fucking goo. But they want to keep on, you know, thinking that materialism has got some teeth left. It doesn't. It never had anyway. But right in the modern age, they want to create static. And so what do you do? You pick on a bunch of punch bags and easy. And then the other guys who want to create static so they don't have to face their own guilt get into big fist fights with the atheists. It's perfect setup. I've seen it from the start like this. And the crowd it watches back, it and they don't know there's alternatives to all that stuff. Well, this is the big thing that my work tries to bring to the bear is that there's a tra you know, traditional, oh, sorry, there is a Western magical tradition that dates from, you know, the great hermeticists of uh, Italy. If you just, you know, there's so many starting points at this, but, you know, Pico della Mirandola, uh, Marcino, uh, Marce Marcello Ficino, and others, they translated the, you know, the Corpus Hermetica which is not perfect, by the way. There's Gnostic elements crept in there. You know, and that's a long story of how that happened. There's been a cross-pollination, an evil one between Gnosticism and Hermeticism. If you go back to the cyberpunk tarot interviews we've done, and uh, there, there is, oh, uh, my premiums on Gnosticism will walk you through all of that. New Ageism is Gnosticism. You'd be amazed. That, that finally, you know, it was a contaminated thread or corrupt thread that ran through what we call hermeticism. So hermeticism is not unadulterated, unfortunately. You know, it's got these other bizarre, some Eastern shit thrown in. It's got contaminated like everything has. Everything. Yeah. But the pure version of the high area, and this includes the entire story of astrotheology and astrology, is part of this Aryan teaching, as many other things were. The Bach saga preserves other amazing fucking shit. You know, uh, uh, the, you know, there's many strands to contribute to what hermeticism really is. It's a vast study. We've been doing brilliant stuff on it here. <clears throat> Probably on Unslaved is the best platform for teasing out, you know, the hermetic tradition, what that's all about. And, the, and then up until the time of Hegel and Schelling, you see you had another iteration of it that itself got crushed and got boulderized by the Marxists. And the postmodernist that sees no sooner do you have the rising of the real thing as the you know Pepsi Cola version is immediately preferred and dispensed. It's so fucking tragic, you know. You're just about to reach it again, and Western man, you know, shoots himself in the fucking foot. But as long as this Christianity in all of its forms, Protestant, Catholicism, all the myriad divisions, see one reason why there are so many denominations is that people are uncomfortable with the lie that they believe so in squirming they go let's form seventh day of that no the baptist no the method no don't you see that that's all squirming because you know it doesn't sit right you know you've you've spoken about this before as well why there's so many fucking denominations i know alvin boyd kuhn does yeah. <laughs> it says a lot just that doesn't it just that the fact that there's competing factions within the, the supposedly reading the same unadulterated holy text that's you yeah. know like but if you knew that the, what you believe is false, that would be a catalyst, wouldn't it? To creating a version, another version of it. Because mm -hmm. you're not sitting right with the one version. That's why there's so many, I mean, it's so obvious. It's no brainer. The many denominations and twisted, crazy versions of this church and that church and you know all of the other sundry paths that cropped up in America is because the original doesn't quite fit. So what are Jehovah's Witnesses? Why did they go off and do? But some Mormons, the Quakers, right? The fucking Seventh Day Adventists, and all of the groups I just mentioned, and many, many more. Obviously, the one thing doesn't fit, so it hybridizes almost immediately. But you never get out of the trap because each one still contains the flaw, the, the crack in the crystal. And until religion is no more, like Shelley asked. Right? That the last king is strangled with the guts of the last priest. Yeah. Put that over your bed. You'll never fight the tyranny.
It's autocratic and it's theocratic. And it, both of them work on guilt. So your Prince Charles, he's the high priest. He's the king, you know. His mother before him was the head of the black nobility. You see? These are priests. The king is always under the priest. Well, look at the contradiction of this. It's so, I was thinking this is kind of ironically hilarious that all the same woke types that were screaming for decades about white patriarchy are now actually on Twitter right now, Michael, swearing allegiance to the new king who just so happens to be a white patriarch. <laughs> I'm like, what are the fucking odds? Yeah, well, see, there's a, that's interesting. He is, he and the, that fucking monster, Schwab, oh. feed you guilt from morning to night about what you're doing to the planet. Yeah, the climate religion, yeah. Yeah, that, the, the, behind that is the guilt. Started right. with Al Gore, right? But it worked. How, if you're 18 years old, how the fuck have anything you do got to do with you know the, the climate? You know, we've had Ralph Ellis on who walked us through every detail of the farce. But, you know, again, <clears throat> so he's shadow banned, right? And intelligent people you know, don't listen to him. So, but this is the guilt trip. So, but you'd say, but that 18 year old doesn't give any shit about Christianity. No, but it's in their blood. It is still there. They're still in the ethos of it. They know Christians. Many of them go to these mega churches. They're, they haven't weeded it out for themselves because weeding it out is to read Alvin Boyd Kuhn, is to know how it got installed in the first place. It's ins and outs, like a satiric was doing, to dive in and find out what is this lie, how is it, what does it consist of? Right, and then he finds you know the work of people like me and Ralph and others, great all these enormous Greek scholars that he had on, you see, to tease it all out and find out. That's a man who knew how to find out what he does not already know. The human race today is not able, you know, even with the internet, they don't know how to find out that which they do not know because they don't know they, they don't they don't know anymore. They're so opinionated, they think they know, right? They're all uh, arrogant enough, these millennials, to believe that they know all there is to know, and there's nothing of your rotten system that they need to know. That's the, you know the deconstruction of it, the critical theory. I need to, I know enough about your system to know it's patriarchal and rotten. So you can't talk to them. They're the dead. They're intellectually dead. And but, isn't that the uh, perfect cover story for maybe the fear of knowing? Well, maybe that's what it is. Well, no, it's the fear of being a self. These people are dri dri dripping in all their complex is based in self-loathing. Hmm. And that relates back to, you know, their matrophobia and things that nobody wants to talk about. So like, like, like say the girl's mutilation of herself, it's more, it's more in the girls than it is in the boys. All right. Why is that? That already shows you what I'm talking about because in the great fight, I don't know what interview it was where I talked about, you know, uh, the teenage, uh, well, even in their dress, you know, the ripped clothes and all is a fight with the parents. Oh yes. It was a uh, one on uh, female Illuminati where we talked about the blood soaked pop icons like Madonna, where you keep seeing this blood or fangs or claws, right? It's ubiquitous. That has nothing to do with anything but my fight with my mother and whether I'm going to win it or not. That's all it's about, right? And the blood doubles up for the menstrual, which is the girl has to be old enough to turn around and have the guts to face the mother. As a younger girl, she's the victim. But if I shed menstrual blood and I show it all over me, and then they have these meat dresses and there's a lot of other symbolism involved in this is to show you know i'm not able to turn i'm going to enter into a fight with you let's see who's going to win this scrap now so the coming of age of a girl is that her teenage gives her teenage years see there was a there was a just a couple of weeks ago it was all over the net about this mother who sat this beautiful daughter down i don't know if you've seen it who had this most beautiful long blonde hair she sat her daughter down and she fucking chopped this kid's hair into this crazy elfin, you know, boyish look. She looked like some fucking Mia, Mia Farrow gone mad. There is not a person on this planet who could tell you why that happened. And it happens to girls all over the place. It's called female envy, where the mother who's lost her looks and lost her appeal absolutely lives. And I, I can't stress this enough in a state of pathological envy of the beauty of the, her own daughter. It's part of the matrophobia. And so much so that it can take many forms. 
butchering the daughter's looks and making them you know look like a fucking social justice warrior is one of these you know they approve it they, they look themselves like that they sometimes dress sloppy and get their own looks to be like this and the daughter follows suit stupidly in the form of right because remember matrophobia is to be covered up so you cover it up by pretending that you're you love mother mother and that you'll do anything she does you see this is, this is if you have tra eyes to see you'll see it then there's even sorcery involved in this where the mother's will is so necrophilous that they will ban jacks the girl's talent almost willing the girl to like damage herself like have an accident say 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 an example one that crossed my path was a girl whose ice skating career was totally destroyed by her falling down and breaking her ankle and she's relating the story having it you know doesn't know now I'm looking at that and going, uh -huh, uh -huh. and it was obvious to me, as because it's not just one person who goes through this, many, many girls do this, where the mother's will sabotages their royal road to success. Now, the thing, the story doesn't end there because, of course, the child actually knows this deep down inside, but has it heavily repressed. So later on, when they, you know, they go towards the rock and roll or gothic lifestyle, you know, the black fingernails and the tattoos and the fucking you know the pins and the black eyeliner and the emo looks this is all i'm in the leather and the hanging out with your lemmies and all the biker types and all right it's like what the fuck is that like i'm for this yeah but those chicks don't care about you these chicks are rehearsing something you stupid goats right and sparring going to the bad boys is all part of it but it's all focused on on the fight with the mother but to get to the point during this dragon fight, there's only going to be one or two, one of two outcomes. I defeat her and put her in her place and go, ah, done. Right? Or I succumb again and I lose the fight and I, 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 you know, have to fall back into society and drift away and, you know, I get neurotic. So this is all what happens in every girl's life, whether they know it or not. You know, so these, uh, what, when you lose the fight, the self-loathing, self-loathing is there anyway, but this, you're trying to overcome your self-loathing by going, yeah, did it. And if you know how to read symbolism on advertising, you know, where women are in advertising and, and all sorts of, sit, not sitcoms, but, you know, commercials on TV, but also in magazines, you'll see this pose. You can decode everything I'm talking about by looking at the various poses and the various, uh, you know, attitudes of women. In regards how they've overcome this and the, the desire is to overcome their self-loathing now what happens to those women then who don't feel that they've won the fight that their mother again turned out to be the winner again and this happens right then that woman becomes necrophilus she's lost the dragon fight and she's riddled with metrophobia well, then there's different levels of the mild neurosis, the high ne you know, neurosis, the psycho psychosis, you know, and, and the four other we've talked about before, you know, in uh, surviving the pathocracy, the pathocalypse article, I go into all of that. These, you know, you become one of these hysterics. And if you're hysterics, you join the crowd. If you're schizoid, you join the crowd, right? So all of the, everything we're seeing in today is born out of these psychological dynamics. But even the ones that I've just described, although ubiquitous throughout the world, they almost take a secondary seat to the one of religion. Because religion is so old, it deals with the emotions, it deals with the transcendent imago, not just mom and dad. We're, we're into God now. We're into transcendent father figures. We're into transcendent mother figures, right? We're dealing with the whole of Mexico, the whole of Ireland, the whole of Spain. You know, we're dealing with whole cultures who, who are going to be riddled with primal guilt. And they won't listen, not even to the atheists. They won't listen to anybody saying, hey, hey, look, you know, this doesn't make sense. There were 16 crucified saviors, you know, the whole thing, right? You don't want to listen to any of that. <clears throat> Until the sixth century, Jesus didn't even have a beard. He was always presented as a young child, you know, young youth. Hey, you know, what do we do that? Or this part was introduced later on. The rapture has no precedent in Christianity. Baptism was not supported by Jesus. Common prayer was not supported by Jesus in the Bible. You know, all of these, all of the myriad of contradictions.
just go to my Cursey Graves pages on fucking astrotheology.com and come back and tell me I'm wrong. Or James Wheelis or any of these great minds that we're talking about, right? The contradictions are so rife. You, But the thing what I'm trying to say here is that you know it. The, the most deep believer is in a state of inner crisis. And that guilt that's awakened from his moral center, his moral voice, is plays right into the hands of any monster. Any George Soros, any Klaus Schwab, any Al Gore, anybody at all that wants to rule this Mao or it's Stalin, they run it by then awakening guilt. You're not a communist? Like in Mao Zedong's world, you know, you're one of those revolutionary reactionaries put you up against a wall. Do you know you're taking the food out of your brother's mouths? That's what they're doing to us in Canada right now. That's how they're talking to anybody that doesn't go along with what Trudeau's up to. Yeah, the shaming that they do. You're a trucker. You 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 have the dare to speak against us. Uh, you didn't get the vax. Do you know what that means for your neighbors and the, and the people in your school and you know all this? You see, and but what we were talking about is not that. That's obscene. Where's the pushback? I am, I am now describing the dynamics of the impotency against it. So I hope people, the one who really gets this, can take the deepest sigh and go, all right, now I am initiated. Because now I'm no longer looking for that. It may come in another form, but I now am tempered in my vision of what the world is going to do and not do. And I can make my own personal decisions then and stop hanging around the street corner waiting for revolution to happen. I, I'm more chastened and more tempered, I understand. Because you're right, this block needs to be removed. And since it's bloody unlikely that it will, in fact, we may even have a, a religious resurgence of anything, it would be much more likely than what I'm talking about. Well, you, you can be ready for that now. Right? You can be ready attitudinally for that right now. Or you do as esoteric thoughts was doing and say, I'm a bit weak on this, uh, this, you know, the thing you're pointing about Christianity and religion in general. Now I'm going to dive in and start studying it. Where's your astrotheology site? Where are those interviews? Right. So now you you go slow with yourself, but you do it in this very calm and meditative way because you now know. And this goes whether you're believing in the Dalai Lama's fucking Buddhism number or some hinduism or sikhism <clears throat> it won't matter what we've just said about western christianity goes for all of these groups mm. and it's guilt 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 did you go to, you didn't go to church on the sunday or you didn't go to the synagogue and they say oh my god and the sikhs have their own guilt trip no. and you had fish on the friday or you drank on, don't you know where's the picture of the guru in your living room yeah, and why did you have sex before 21 when the guru says you can't have it, you won't be able to get initiated and blah, 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 right? Guilt, 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 guilt. But it's so ubiquitous, we don't notice it. But when you do and you really take it seriously on a very deep level, now you're empowered in a way that I wish the whole human race was empowered. And one could naively say, well, atheism, that is the royal road to what you're talking about. No, it's not. Because that scientism is a dogma of its own. They're just replacing it with, no, <coughs> no, it doesn't work, right? There's other, you see, because that's steering you away from, I want to get people back to the religious, sorry, to the moral conscience within. But atheism doesn't lead you away. It leads you away from it just as religion leads you away from it. They both serve the same purpose of removing you from your center. You are an embodiment of the moral universe. The very dimensions of your body, right? The phi ratio and the Fibonacci, right? And all of that, the golden section is in your body. That is there so that you can physically measure your coordinates as anthropos. That is the moral universe within and the, and the, and the moral universe without or in simpatico, right? But we don't teach sacred geometry or sacred principles and number you know, to, to our children. We've just had Scott on, start on, right? Oh, great. Going over that again. We've done brilliant stuff with him before. Yeah. How many times does that need to be drilled into people? Well, how many books on sacred geometry are in the average shelf? 
you know, where your children can get hold of it. <clears throat> How many people who even did art, you know, kids have got a really good artistic expression. How many of them know about sacred geometry? And what what's really behind that? And that you're the proportions of your own body embody it. And these fucking Leonardo da Vinci's knew that. If you knew it, do you know how that would change your attitude towards how a city is designed and a house is designed and you know all these other things and how organic then you would be designing things? And you wouldn't hate your body so much. You wouldn't be no. getting sucked into this uh I don't feel like I'm what I'm born in my body. You wouldn't get sucked into that nonsense. Right. So back to the thing about the mutilation. The girl who fails in her matrophobic fight does what? The aggression that should have been healthily focused on the perpetrator of evil in their life turns out to be immune to that. You can't express it. What is the next psychological syndrome? Self-hate. I, yeah. I, cu I cut at my genitalia. Because I hate myself for being a failure in the in the fight. Right? The pussy gets the blame because the pussy is the female. Right? So you're turning instead of turning it on to the Medus and mother, you turn it on yourself. You cut your breasts off, you want to change, you want to be a boy, you want to be a, right. It's epidemic amongst girls because of this. It all devolves back to matrophobia, the electro complex. All the details are on the dragon mother site, right? <clears throat> Nobody wants to know. <laughs> Nobody picks it up because it's ubiquitous. It's in the blood. So the girl is loaded with self-loathing and then wants to make up for it by the bling and by the champagne parties at Vegas and the, the limousines with the jacuzzis in it and following some imbecile celebrity and then being attracted to all the blood and gut symbolism. See, right? they're not aware of anything we're talking about, but they will go for the symbolism provided by the media. So in the same way that the media lure you with that symbolism, the same way that the controllers lure you with guilt, to, or they're immobilizing you. So inner meets outer, you know. So until the story of matrophobia goes around and women can revalue, you know, uh, reevaluate, and suddenly realize I'm doing this to myself, I'm butchering my femininity because I uh, failed in my heroic task. Of confronting the parents just like this mother who butchered the looks of her daughter out of just pure spite and envy and wanted to hold back she actually hates beauty hates her daughter is going to go tomorrow and you know do well in life and impress the boys and marry rich and all that mother couldn't stand it and there she was on pop actually ran a camera to show how she's doing it and the girl sits there grinning yeah, yeah i think i i'm okay with this right riddled with fucking hatred but can't express it because it's adultism. Adultism prevents you, but later on in the teenage years, right, you start to turn it within. So all the syndromes we see of women in their teenage years is self-loathing, self-hatred, because they've lost the dragon fight. And the controllers of all these narratives that we're seeing this um, on the cultural level of these social engineers, they know what you're talking about. That's Completely. why it's important to know what you're talking about. Is people think, oh, it's got it's kind of uncomfortable. Yeah, because you got to know that they have this dialed in and they actually know how to weaponize this shit, let alone and they the do so, part of it, you know. Right. And they do so by making psychology, cutting it out. In the 1970s, for just a blip, there were some movies, there were some excellent books. It was kind of popular along with the you know, subliminal seduction stuff. Books on psychology, hidden persuaders, all psychological. <clears throat> it blipped again, but quickly. I've I've got a article called "Say No to Psychology." Read that on the Dragon Mother site. We can maybe link it up, and that will walk you through that. It came and it went, uh, and that's a sad thing. And then by the time of the '80s, it was cancelled again. It has been ever since. You can get your doctor fills, but that's mostly just accusing people and just tepid tepid you see the real thing is not in the world um so you know that's why my work is dedicated to changing that but it's an anti-psychological country and then on the, back to the christian thing that is a, a, is the real hamstr hamstrings you know the masculine woman and the masculine man from fighting tyranny so then again when you know that this is the thing that's blocking the gears you can't get out right the clutch won't work you just can't get into the next gear 
it actually is a, it, it helps you pull over and breathe. You know the answer now. And hard as that fact is to di you know di di digest, you at least now can e you know be easy on yourself. You've got it. It's not going to happen. So you can stop panicking, right? And right, and then you find a you know a calm still point from which to build again. It is very very important for this to take place in people's lives. So it's very cathartic. And you can see that the, the people have this deadly mark on them and how they're just completely the puppet masters of total control over their psyche and what the dangers of religion were and are. And then you can say, right, I'm not an atheist. I'm not, a, you know, I'm just, I'm just observing the fact. And now I know about the guilt complex, you know, and uh, we've done great podcasts on it in the past especially on the existential aspect of it where the shame comes in to be involved as well you know uh but you can see that that is the the the, the nugget you believe a lie and you know it's a lie even though you believe it there's a deeper moral voice that knows that you believe a lie that creates an organic form of guilt that the leaders then know how to manipulate to the nth degree and that immobilizes anyone even though there's crimes happening all around you crimes that your forefathers would have fucking dragged out and stamped on immediately. But now you know it's etiology. Now you know the history of tyranny and how it works, you know, with the guilt complex. And I mean, yeah, as hard as this might be for people, you have to remember that evil always hides behind the light, right? That's the whole point of understanding this idea of princes of light. It sounds right. glorious, doesn't it? If only, but it's not. It's the the princes that wield the light as a weapon to blind you from the truth. And that's the difference. And that's why these things are so successful is because they know you want spirituality. They know you want to connect more to yourself, to nature, to God, or whatever you want to call it. But they just know how to get in the way and manipulate you into their little basket of it and their little, uh, their little way of doing it. And then that disempowers you from even having the true connection. This was what I was hearing when I was doing this bit with Alvin Boyd Kuhn was he was lamenting and trying to say in the beginning, he's like, he, he personally was trying to say, I'm not here to destroy religion. I'm here to put it back in its rightful place. Right. And his definition of religion would differ from the average person. Right. And you get into it and you go, oh, okay. And he said, we got turned off the rails at some point, something came in. And I remember he even asked, he's like, in later stages of history than the time I'm writing in, maybe we'll figure out whether this was an organic process that happened to corrupt it or whether there was a hidden hand at work. And I went, well, now we're in the modern age and we know maybe a bit of both, but definitely the hidden hand. And um, I guess I know we're wrapping up here, Michael, but really quickly, this brings up my question that I know comes from people that are maybe sort of skeptical of some of it. They might say if they still come from that Christian way of looking at this conspiracy is they'll say, well, isn't the tenets of the Illuminati to eradicate religion as one of their uh, attacks on the on the culture? And isn't that also what you're saying? Right. This this was this would be one of the critiques they would come up with. And you've studied this a long time. What would you say would be their reason for putting that trope out? Or do they have a different meaning when they're saying that? What do you think about that? Well, it's just false information. The Illuminati were religious. That's the answer. Their own writings, if you go to it, Baron von Nig and Adam Weishap were deeply spiritual people. They believed in God. They're not atheists. Whoever put that out is a liar and a disinformationalist and somebody who didn't read the original documents. Hmm. All the original documents, they just wanted to get rid of priest culture, which they thought had become, you know, foul. Now, it's true that there were people who were Jacobins, like I said, the founder, the funder of the Illuminati, one of them, Moses Mendelssohn, was a leading Jacobin, right? But just because you're not actually card-carrying Catholic at that time didn't mean that you, you weren't a, a deist, say, for instance, right? Mm. Or a pantheist, you know, or a believer in God. So actually, it turns out that they were believers in God. There's no, there's not even hardly any evidence at all of them being atheists. Which so that's actually disinformation, you know. So that's how you you, you stop that one. Um, 
Yeah, the Illuminati were not atheists. That's not what they were about. They were uh, mystics who, in their own way, this is one of the reasons why they were able to attract people like Shelley, you know, and Schiller, uh, and some of these great intellectuals, and Goethe, you know, there, there was a sort of people, a bevy of people hovering around the Illuminati, you know, uh, and sort of sort of into, into them. Because they, people believed the Illuminati's card wasn't atheism. It was shaking off the chains of Orthodox religion. Largely for the same reasons we're talking about, because there's bullshit. Now, your average Christian who believes in the bullshit will always frame it as if the Illuminati was against religion. That's too narrow. I, that's what the religious man believes, that they were a threat to his religion. Well, he, he thinks anybody was a threat. He hates everybody, including denominations of his own religion. Why would you believe what they say? Hmm. And these guys have their own, you know, sort of religious understanding. The fucking Priory of Zion do. The Templars do. The Cistercians do. They're all... Remember, remember, this is easy to understand when you say... You can be Gnostic. So let's take Moses Mendelssohn for, for you know, as an example. Super Jew is funding the Illuminati. When they sit around and have these convocations and meetings with their friends, they're they're talking. They are talking about German idealism. They're talking about Schopenhauer. You know, they're talking about atheism. They're they're looking at the all, all of this, and they are coming from the way I look at it is that they're coming from a Gnostic point of view. And the moment that you see this, you say the Demiurg who, who fashioned this world as a plaything, has enslaved all of us. So we are the Gnostics who see that this is the case. We come, you know, from that tradition. We're the alumni. Part of the Demiurg's matrix of control are the priests, the black robes. Hey, we used to, I used to be one of them. I used to believe it. My dad's a clergyman. But I've, re, I've renounced it. Or my dad was a, a rabbi, says the Jewish members. Fuck, I got away from that. I'm an enlightened young man. But Blake, you can't think of anybody back then. Hegel, they all flew the flag of freedom and liberty until they all woke up, right? But many of the great minds that we uh, know, Beethoven, was a card carrying, you know, liber liberal. Who's until Napoleon, when Napoleon crowned him, so the famous story is that when Napoleon crowned himself emperor, the symphony that Beethoven had composed for the Napoleon called Eroica, he stabbed his pen right through it, and you can still see the manuscript today. He defaced Eroica, later he brought it back out again because his friends begged him to. But he, and Hegel the same, Hegel pulled his hair out going, you fucking tyrant bastard. But all the young men were behind Napoleon's, you know, ride through Europe, bringing liberty and fraternity to all. Right. So this was the this was the phase of the libertine and, and those who were trying to cast off the chains. <clears throat> you know, it's like you know, cast off the chains that bind you. Shelley's great poem, right? Cast them down. You know, we are many; they are few. All of this, like I said, you know, the last king strangled with the guts of the last priest. So the Illuminati were answering that. But the religious fucker accuses them of being, you know, devil worshippers and atheists. There's nothing to support that at all. They're evil. If you if you want to call them evil, go ahead. But do it as we've done in this program. Show what they were created for. Yeah. Part camouflage, part this, part that, right? All these secret societies had their own uh, reason for existing. These clerics were busy, 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 busy. And they wanted to recruit intelligent men, highly intelligent men. But they knew that, you know, there's different flavors. People rather have the Rosicrucians or they have the Grand Orient or Strict Observance or Illuminists, right? You know, Skull and Bones or, you know, there's Catholic guys, there's Protestant guys. We need a bevy of different or organizations for different countries and different religions and different um, dispositions. And that's why you have your guilds and all of the, and then there's conservative people who just won't buy into any liberal stuff. Then you get your ultra liberals, right? So they created all of these different organizations 
to make sure it's a catch-all for the whole human race. They're very it's like mafia fronts when they set up businesses, right? Like it's kind of like that. Like you go in thinking you're buying a cigar, and you don't know you're supporting your local mafia. No, having a clue. But they put the symbolism on yeah. it. If you are smart enough to decode it, like the man riding the horse, the horse, you know, and all. It's 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 wonderful when you get into the symbolism if you can correctly decode it, and that's what female Illuminati is all about. You know that website is to show you you know that uh uh the translate like grail coming from gratos and you know uh, all of the different symbolism that is largely sort of misinterpreted i find you know or poorly interpreted by a lot of other people you know i think they mean well right but the word mont m-o-n-t montefiori mont montbatten rosemont Mark Stewart, what is this M O N T number, right? You see, so there's lots and lots of different uh, clues that they've le left us. And as I say, etymology, symbolism, and then secret society symbolism. Those three is what you have to always use. You know, uh, as means to the end. These are the three keys that help open the many a locked door. But when it comes to today's political climate, why so much evil is so obvious, and everyone is asking the question, any sincere person is, why are we not pushing back? You've got to realize that this is to be at the door of religion. That this is the reason. You know, but America is anti-psychological, so the moment you start talking about guilt complexes and all, they just like glaze right over. They cannot. This is, you know, part of the stone in the shoe that stops you getting to the garden gate, let alone climbing the fucking mountain. So, uh, you know, I'm just waiting to see what can happen along those lines. And the rise of religion, again, and it, as a response to what's taking place, is not a good thing. It may act that, you know, oh, this is good, this mobilizing people, communities getting back together again, and sooner or later they're all going to turn and uh, overthrow tyranny, right? No. I don't I don't see that at all. That's not something I would uh, buy into. And just cuz you know you have ignorance squared you've also got the guilt complex highly, you know, magnified. And I just don't see that taking place. I really don't. I hope the fuck I'm wrong, but I don't see it being the cause. It, it might come from some other motive, you know, there, I'm not I'm not shutting all doors of possibility. But I can tell you that that one to me is is shut. Well, we may make little progresses on certain fronts, right? That's right. Uh, and there might be positives to that for a, a period. Like we've talked about that idea of like a cultural Christianity or something just to ward off the influx of all these other factions. Like you get it, right? But, um, and that's why I did my series on the idea of like an esoteric kind of interpretation, like the way Kuhn and Massey and, right. and many others would look at it to go, oh, well, if you're talking about that, that could actually be more powerful than just going back to the medieval doctrines that have divided it. Like, un think about it. Like, I've always said this too, even about the medics. If everybody keeps going to these medics, um, and then we saw what happened with all this pandemic stuff, and you're still going back to them, well, you're just empowering them and, and not realizing that they are just advertising to your insecurity and your fear of death on the physical domain in the same way that the priests are doing it on the spiritual domain. So if you just keep, if you keep batting those and they're controlled by the same steering committees. Mm -hmm. And so you go, okay, you know, we might get some headway exposing elements of these things, but what you're saying is until the whole picture of the true roots of tyranny and evil get understood and the whole picture of the history, there's not going to be any, permanent change in this permanent change in the world where true freedom and truth and justice exist until those are addressed that's right and remember we've done there's there's not only the premiums on gnosticism but there's at least three back-to-back -back gnostic podcasts and the third one was on alvin boyd kuhn right find those and link them up because it's in the spirit of alvin boyd kuhn that I'm talking about, you know, the, the solutions, the hermetic, hermetic way. And when you have these societies like the Illuminati, they have a Gnostic. They are religious. But they're claiming that the world order that they want to overthrow is in the name of, you know, 
breaking the demiurge's control. So the Christian who knows nothing fucking about that and cannot even spot the Gnostic elements in their own bloody awful religion, accuse the Illuminati <coughs> of being atheists. It's the easiest way, isn't it, to burn them at the stake. But Gnosticism is, the, is at the heart of most of the Eastern religions, at the heart of Christianity, doesn't matter who's arguing different, is at the heart of Judaism, Islam, that the world is a frightful, horrible place, You've got to have these priests and you know to show you the way out um and that's why most of all of those religions are terribly nature hating and world denying uh there's a scene in alex jones's first bohemian grove video where he stands uh you know eating berries off a tree and he clearly says yeah i like nature like the next guy but i'm not going to worship it as he swallows a, a berry I'll never forget that. That's Christianity. He's a Christian, isn't he? So he embodies there perfectly this idea. The hermetic person does worship nature because nature is the prime datum. It is the premise. The you know, go back to basic premises. Nature is your premise. Anyone like a Gnostic who hates the world, and they really do hate it, they want to get away from it. This is where a lot of problems begin. And so the New Age movement is just a new iteration, highly funded, Gnostic cult, hybridized, you know, Gnostic cult. And wherever you find Gnosticism, sadly, you will find sprinklings of, of original Hermeticism because Gnosticism's actual canon is pretty threadbare. And so as the centuries went by, and even right back at the time of Alexandria, the Gnostics start pretty much ladling out you know stealing quite liberally from hermeticists so that's a whole separate scholarly study of how to uh, take out you know the gnostic elements from hermeticism and the hermetic elements from gnosticism you know who the hell wants to you know that's for specialists right but the, the bottom line is hermeticism always goes back to nature gnosticism doesn't bother with it this is a good way to you know really grasp it and so you have this mix of Great scholars who love nature, like Wordsworth and Schelling, and you'll get other intellectuals who are a little bit more, you know, dismissive of nature, but also quite wise people and all of that. But the accusations of Christians to any of these groups is to be taken with a pinch of fucking salt. Because obviously they're the fifth sect. They're a they're one of the most bastardized. Right? James and the Nazarenes were right. Paul is a is a wicked priest. Paul had no right taking Jewish customs of the Messiah, mixing it up with some pagan stuff about sun kings, you know, doing all of these things that Jews find abhorrent. But he's like stealing from them, stealing from the Essenes, stealing from the Nazarenes and other groups, and then <coughs> making this hodgepodge and selling it to the Gentile world of the West, <coughs> which established the fifth sect. They moved to Rome and set up their new bastion of power right on the site of the cult of Mithra who's androgynous Mithra is a female name Mithras Mithra Mithra in Persian is woman it's a feminine word so these early gods like Yahweh were you know androgynous but to keep to the point the papists set up their dynasty and it, and it went strong until you know the 1860s when a massive attempt to overthrow them I believe was successful and it may have taken you know a long time more years than that the details are important i think it's article six or something like that on the female illuminati site the order of sion we go we occult christianity i go into that a bit more um but what we've done now is consolidate the part and add this part about the guyonum because that is a very important road that leads you to the heart of the origins of masonry and without that story of the sadducees and the order of melchizedek I don't think we really have the full story, great as other books have been written. I don't think that the foot, the final piece, the jigsaw, it looks ugly because, you know, there's big pieces missing at the end. I think I've put them in, you know, so that we can finally close the, you know, the book on that, on, on the origins of masonry. Well, it's an incredible study, that's for sure. And these last two podcasts are uh, just a great introduction for people to get in. And um, we'll put all those references below, the premiums, the other episodes, the articles. And um, 
definitely be doing some more on this down the road. So thank you, Michael. Incredible as always. Thanks to everybody here on Unslaved. Lots more coming at you soon. So stay tuned. We'll catch everybody next time. Cheers, everybody.